Hello and welcome to the second part of Del Boy 3K1 in conversation. And uh, we're doing a part two of my friend Rock God 2004. Um, I hope you've managed to see part one. It was incredibly fun for me to do. There was a couple of technical issues. Um, we're hoping that those go away for this session. Um, but of course, it's all a learning curve for us. Um, this is going to be in the same format as it was before. Um, so I do really encourage you to see part one. Um, as we get further into the 2000s, there will be 13 years where we would just talk generally. Um, they're all in our minds at the moment. We're all um, in a at a point where I think we know what's been happening um, in the last uh, decade or so. Um, and so I'm going to bring on my friend, introduce him on, say hello and everything. And uh, we're going to get cracker lacking. So here we go, add to the stage. And here he is in all his glory. How are you doing? I'm perfectly fine. How are you? I'm near so bad. Um, I was just explaining this is part two. I've just said the format is exactly the same. Encourage them to watch the first one. Um, how did you find the first part? Did you find it exciting? Was it nice to go down a nostalgia route? It was. I really enjoyed it, actually. Um, I'd sort of thought about and remembered stuff I'd not thought about in a long time. It's weird. You think of one thing and it sort of triggers another memory of. It's strange. In a good way, though. That, that, that's good. And like I say, we hope the technical issues sort of like go away. Um, I haven't seen anything wrong at the moment, but it was later on last time. Um, as before, Nige, um, if there's anything that's a little bit sensitive that you don't want to talk about, you've got full power to just say that I'd rather not talk about that, it, you know, because it, um, it affects others that might be watching whatever, or, you know, for whatever reason. Um, we covered... 1970 to 1989 last time so we're going to move forward now into 1990 and as before we're going to do question the uh, news that was going on at the time and then i'll ask you some questions um just answer whatever you know just clear your mind and just see if you can think back and then of course i'll always ask you um of a song of that time and a movie or TV or both, if you wish, it's up to you. Um, and we'll pause and then move on. Um, that seems to be pretty good format last time. I thought that was quite good. Um, yeah. So let's start. So 1990, what was happening? Uh, thousands march against the poll tax. Thatcher resigns as PM. John Major comes in as step in PM. The Bermans, Birmingham Sixth. Uh, were freed after a court a court appeal. Robert Maxwell was found dead off the coast of Tenerife. Wow. Everything I do, I do it for you, sets the record as number one for 16 consecutive weeks. I remember that. Now, this one was quite harrowing for me. 1992, Frankie Howard died on the 19th of April. Benny Hill died on the 20th of April, one day later. Wow, I didn't know that. And it was the year that the Windsor Castle caught fire. Uh, Thames Television's certain stations, TVS, TSW, um, ceased broadcasting. So they, they merged into whatever they considered to be their new channels, like ATV came central and so forth. Uh, Oracle Teletext service was discontinued. God. In 1993, the Ford Mondeo was launched and replaced the Ford Sierra. And Man United won the first time for the new formed Premiership. So things moved from being first division, second division, third division, fourth division, to what we now understand as being the Premiership, Championship, first division, second division. It was a huge change in football, which is why I mention it. And in yeah, I care loads about that. Yeah, and in 1994, the Channel Tunnel officially opened. Wow. Sunday Trading, the Sunday Trading Act started. And uh, the first UK National Lottery draw happened in 1994. That's I remember that. 
1990 to 1994. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I'll mute when I ask the question so that you can just talk. I don't want uh, any feedback or anything. So question. Did you buy a Walkman? And what were your thoughts on them? Yeah, I had more than one. Um, I think I had a couple of cassette ones, and I also had a CD one as well in the mid-90s. Um, I used to walk for miles like into the town centre and stuff, and I used to absolutely love me Walkman. Um, and just like everything else you got what you paid for, Sony were always the best. There were, there was other inferior ones and they sounded nowhere near as good. Sony had the bass and the better headphones and everything. Um, yeah, it's weird to think now that stuff like that is classed as old and outdated. Bizarre. I remember them very well. That's brilliant. Yeah, I mean, um, I must admit, I think I only ever had one Sony Walkman. I had some of the sort of like, other players that were around it that were a bit cheaper. I did look for things like Dolby noise reduction, whether they had metal on them. I don't know why. I probably didn't understand either what metal meant and so forth, and whether it made any difference whatsoever. Um, but I did look into them later on and find out. But it's fun to think back. I just bought it because it said it was the best, and uh, I then saved up for it and went for it. So that's a. And then when the auto reverse one came out, that was luxury. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Which brings me to the next one because you answered a question in the first round. So I'm asking this one for now because these are all, what I'm asking you now are all common for this period. There were Walkmans before 1990. It's just that they were at their height in this particular period. So um, I've got a question about multi-CD players in cars. Um, that's became a thing where you could put five or six CDs in a little box in the boot of your car and you could actually choose the different CDs. You said that you had audio in your car, but did you ever have one of those devices or did you ever buy a CD player for your car? Uh, yeah, I did have one of them. Um, I bought a car off my mate once and he'd actually installed one of those in. I'd left it in when I bought the car off him. And it was one of those as well, where when you weren't in the car, you'd press the button and clip the front off and take it with you. So it was totally useless without that front. So you would take that off and go with you. And if you forgot it, though, that was it. You couldn't listen to your CDs. Um, yeah, they were a good idea at the time because like, you weren't just stuck to the one disc. But that is the only time I've ever had a multi one. I've had a couple of cars since where it's had a built in one. Um, but I don't know. I think in car in car ones can sometimes, when they go into that little, because it's just a very, very fine slit. And although it's got like this protective rubbery stuff on, I always found they still marked your disc. So I tend to just put them on a tape at the time or on me on me uh, mp3 player and put them in I never ever trusted them in the end yeah that's that, again it's a good answer because as we move later on these cd players were able to play uh mp3s which meant that instead of yeah. just having 12 or so tracks um you could actually have old albums like five six seven albums and, and go through them and it's quite right. The quick release mechanism, the front fascia plate, was actually able to come out. So, yes, it would make it absolutely useless. But I still found that thieves stole them. <laughs> they must have, like, yeah. uh, but they were able to order ones off, like, cheap ones off of Taiwan or something. I have no idea. And you're quite right that there is a film, there is either a roller or a, or a rubber flap that, 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 that goes inwards where your CD would come in and it used to go in and out quite smooth um and some of the more expensive ones you could actually add a controller to your steering wheel so that the actual you press the button and it came out so that's brilliant now you got to take your mind back to here i sort of know the answer but i want to hear your story on this and that is that we've talked about vhs tapes we talked about um widescreen came out we've talked about um tellies um that were now becoming widescreen and so forth and of course we're now in the in the in the period where sky is skyrocketing in regards to its subscribers 
and there is now more than just three or four or five channels most homes were now getting cable um, or sky of some sort so i've got a little question to you which was about laser disc in the uk becoming popular because it did during this this particular part did you own one and what are your thoughts on this medium now you're um a, we're a lot further past that particular format yes i did get one um I remember them coming out in about, I don't know, it was early, sort of mid-80s, and there were layers of vision at the time. And the first one I saw was when I worked in a TV shop, which I think I might have mentioned previous. I went on a YTS thing, and I was in, like, a, a hi-fi TV shop and stuff. Yeah, I did, because I saw Bang & Olsen. And they had one on display, and these things were huge. They were massive um, and expensive at the time. And then, like... It seemed to die a death. But then in the 90s, I remember going into a Sony shop where my mate worked, who I used to work at the other place with. And he was showing me these laser disc players. And it was like the films that were coming out were ridiculous. And you could get them imported from the States. Um, but I would tell you, was a little bit behind. So, like, if you put a PAL one on, which was ours, it would fill the screen. But if you put an NTSC one on, it would like jump down a bit and squash it a bit. Something to do with the, the rate and all that stuff. But most of my discs that I owned were American. And I absolutely loved the format. I thought, my God, it ain't going to get any better than this. That's it. We're at the maximum now, not realizing what was to come in the future. Um, I think the first disc I ever owned was The Shining. Um, and that was an American import. It was on two discs. Where people would say to me, I couldn't be bothered with that. You have to get up and turn it over. I actually found that quite exciting, really. <laughs> Don't know what it was. It was like watching a film on a record. You'd have to get up and turn it over. And if it was a long film, you'd get a double double disc, sometimes a triple, and you'd have to get up and turn it over multiple times. Um, I wish I still had it. Um, when I went through um, a breakup, I didn't I didn't get it. Um, it. It was left there, and I've never seen it again since. But I had a Sony one, um, and it had the top of the range laser in for the CD as well, and it was linked up to my iFi, and my God, did that have some volume on it. It sounded absolutely fantastic. So mine was mainly on my iFi, but then if I wanted to watch a laser disc, I would take it down and plug it into the telly as well. Um, but some of the titles I had on laser disc, absolutely brilliant. I'd love to get them now again just to collect them because instead of just getting these little 4K and Blu-ray covers, you had a big sort of 12-inch record side sleeve um, with all that lovely, glorious artwork and light records. You sometimes used to get gatefolds as well. They were definitely an item of beauty, but yeah, the picture was great. But strangely enough, DVD was better on a tiny disc when it came out. Um, but if I had the chance to have another laser disc player now, yeah, I'd snap that hand I'd love one again. I miss them. That's brilliant. And like I say, my 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 um, memories of, of that period mirror your own. Um, probably slightly a little bit more that I can add to it. Um, yes, I had two laser disc players in my lifetime, and I've got still both of them. Both of them were Pioneer, although there were, were other models. They seem to have a resurgence in this particular period because they were they have been around in America since, believe it or not, the 70s. Um, but over here, it seemed like there was a particular year that they took off. And I think it's around about the period of time where pubs were doing karaoke's. I think that's probably something to do with it. But I never really look back to say, was it that or not? Because karaoke did become a really big thing in the pubs in the 90s. And karaoke was huge in Japan. Um, so it, it, it makes sense that um, it probably came about from that. Um, when you mentioned about the picture, yeah, PAL pictures have got more lines on, on a CRT screen. It's uh, than America. America's got 500 and something lines. PAL had 600 and something lines. So when you, because they were, um, they were multi-system, um, basically you, it, it would, it would able to put it into the mode that you needed for your country, which was another added boon. But what you, 
what you found out later on was it doesn't matter how multi-format it was, you couldn't put them onto videotape uh, because of the protection and the format. You had to use a converter box that it went into and then into a video recorder for you to give your friends a videotape version of the, <laughs> the laser disc. And believe me, there were a lot of my friends that went, oh, you've got that. That's only at the pictures now. Because the other memory I have of it is, is that I was buying laser discs usually in the same month or only a month away from the same thing being released in, in England at the pictures. And mm -hmm. that's because of how long it took for films to come across into this country. Um, so you're quite right. Um, there was a big reason for me to have one and they were so expensive. And my, 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 um, first impressions of them were that they were built like a tank and there were so many connections at the back it was like wow how many connections is this it's got two scar composite all these cables that came out the back which just sort of like showed what it could do and then the other smart thing i liked about it was the the drawer that came out was split so it could have the whole tray coming out or just the little tray for you to put little cds in which I thought was great. But when you open the whole well, it had loads of little inner circles when it was going in. And you're quite right. You could buy multi-sided um, players where the head would switch to the other side so you didn't have to take the disc out. But if you didn't have that sort of money, you had to put the disc in and turn it over. And like you were saying, some discs came on two or even three discs um that's because there was also something called compression even then um you could have them um uncompressed but you only recorded like 25 minutes of video or you had it compressed and you could have 50 minutes but then a film would be an, you know two hours or so and it therefore needed the other side plus one other disc with the other side not being used the other thing i loved about the format was you could have scripts and pictures and you could just mm -hmm. still frame through them. And it had the most perfect of pauses. You hit pause, the picture stayed there, unlike a VHS. But I'm going into something that I have a big passion about. I wanted to know your feelings on it. The last thing I'm going to mention of it was you couldn't get laser discs very easy unless you went catalog route. And I used a company called Laser Disc Enterprises. And I've still got one of their catalogs. It's great to look back at it. Uh, and the prices, my God, yeah, you did not pay some import duty on those that they slapped on. Um, so fantastic memories. Thank you so much for bringing your memories um, to that. Um, I'm going to move on now um, to another technical boon that happened between these periods. Mobile phones became cheaper. When did you get one? And was it a Nokia? Uh, yes, it was a Nokia. Oh, God, it'll have been about... I think I got mine... Whoa, it must have been... It was either Christmas 2001 or Christmas 2002. Um, I didn't have one before that. I never really had any interest in them in the when they first came out, but then they were getting more and more popular. Um, maybe you want to, we'll, 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 we'll cross that bridge when we get to the 2000s. I have actually brought phones into that era, but I, but by that time we had touchscreen. So that's when I started to bring mm. that in. I remember that my, with my mobile phone, um, I got my first mobile phone just in 1994, but it, I didn't really use it at all until I moved away from home and went to Manchester. So it really was the mid years of the next block of years that we're going to be talking about. But from um, the internet's point of view, this was the period when people were not have, carrying around bricks anymore. They had small Nokias and people were playing snake and all sorts of stuff on their phone, but they didn't have the functionality that we'll talk about a little bit later on. So we'll move on to the next question. Um, and again, this will all depend on, your knowledge and, and 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 where you were with this dial up had now progressed to higher speeds um and uh, and pcs were becoming cheaper 
Um, what are your thoughts of this particular period? Did you get a PC here or a bit later? Did you move from dial-up to faster speed? Or did you not even have internet until broadband came, which was a little bit later on? It's just it did start to change around about this period. Yeah, we got a PC. Um, in 2000, we got it. And it was still dial-up. Um, it was slow as hell, but when you first get one, it was amazing. Um, uh, it used to be, though, unfortunately, you couldn't use the phone and the computer at the same time. So if you were going to go on the phone, whoever was on the computer had to hang up. Uh, that was a bit of a pain with two kids in the house um, and me, because I was a third kid, really. Um, but uh, my daughter at that time, she will have been... 10 she was born in 1990 so she used to like to go on it and my son he was born in um 93 so he was seven and he always wanted to go on his um just to do daft kid stuff it was nothing like i think with them though they were more for the games and the internet um i think i just mainly wanted the internet for ebay because i'd heard about ebay and the stuff you could get <laughs> so yeah it was 2000 when we first got one yeah, so we can talk about that again a little bit later on. Like I say, for some, like me, um, I had uh, my first US Robotics 56K modem, and uh, which, uh, and I had to shout down to my parents to say, I'm using on the internet, because so you're not going to get any phone or anything. And I remember our first bill, because we were paying, you were paying by the minute on this service, and our first bill was like uh, for the month was like 175 pounds. And I suddenly got a slap on the wrist uh, for having that and had to pay that first bill. And uh, we spoke to the telephone company and they put us on a different tariff. They didn't realize that we'd got a US robotics modem. And, and so they were charging us for like having a phone call for that length of time. Um, wow. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm Piracy has always been something that's been around for me because of computers and computer games. But I was now using a modem and the internet for getting music and so forth. But we'll talk about that sort of thing again in a moment. Um, so we'll move on. And like I say, you, we, you can come back to that if you want, or we can just leave it. But the next question is about the magazine boom of FHM and GQ. Um, apparently the boon of these two magazines or lads mags as they later became um, was around about 1994 that was the sweet spot for these um, did you hear about them did you know about them did you ever buy them um, what were your thoughts on them they were really supposed to be um, a product for you to look at watches and what clothes to wear and all of that sort of stuff but I always tended to find them to be cheap versions of penthouse really I mean it was women with bikinis on and that were on in on TV but just what your thoughts really on on uh, glad you know these these types of magazines I had zero interest I never bought a single one that was it any any thoughts? Did any of your friends use them? Did you read them? Did you want see them in barbers shops? Anything? Somebody, uh, I can't remember who the hell it was, but somebody used to get them, and they said, "Oh, have you seen this?" I, I went, "What is supposed to do with this?" He was like, "Oh, they take a magazine for men." I went, "Shit, I've got no interest." <laughs> it did nothing for me at all. Cars, and I, they get you to it from A to B. <laughs> with horror and metal, then yeah, I'm there. Nah, not for me. I'm not into cars, nothing like that. Um, motorbikes, um, leather-clad women stretching all over car bonnets. It's a lot of the shit. It doesn't interest me at all. Pretty much my feelings. Um, I never bought them. Uh, a couple of my friends had them, and when I went around their house, um, I'd flick through one. Um, I could never afford the clothes. They were all designer wear. Uh, the watches were people you'd have to be James Bond and and be able to afford them. They were um, those indestructible types that would cost you two or three hundred pounds. And I'm going, I can't afford two hundred or three hundred pence. The magazines were way too expensive, I thought. Um, and I just, I just thought I'd rather buy a specialist magazine like NME, Fangoria, Starburst, uh, a film magazine. 
than have this all-encompassing thing which had a load of women glamour photography in it. So I'm a little bit like you. Um, I could, I could so, have been the richest man on the planet. I still would have had no interest in it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's one of those things where I, I, I think I was still in that phase where um, I was soaking in knowledge. If somebody had something new and they showed it to me, I wasn't going to turn around and go, nah, not interested. I'd look at it and I'd go, yeah. Um, but I wouldn't then, unless it was something that was exciting, I wouldn't go out and buy it myself. You see what I mean? Um, it's it's not like um, you're going around to friends and listen to an album and then you hear a track and you go, right, I'm going to buy that album tomorrow. I really like that album. I didn't know it was out there. I like that track. It wasn't like that. Um, no. And, uh, you know, so magazines, though, were popular. We're, we're talking about a period where so many news agents had so many magazines all over the racks in different genres. And I was talking about something that of our age group in that in that 90s period, you could have been buying them. So thanks for your input on that. It was just just really to clarify, really. And the last question of this particular period is not really a question. Um, it's more a little bit about your thoughts, because at the end, for, for this particular period, and we look at music as having periods like punk, disco, and so forth, the big expanse were the following. Electronic, house, techno, dance, rave, and drum and bass. Those were the big rises um, of music in this particular period. What's your thoughts? Um, anything that you absolutely dislike and still dislike? Um, did any of it... Um, did you buy the odd one even because you went to a nightclub and liked a particular dance track, but you don't like dance. It was just the beat of it, the sound of it, whatever your thoughts anyway, Nigel, on those particular sort of like genres that increased in popularity during that period. Absolute fucking shit. I hated them all. No, I never bought one. I'm not even going to dwell on it anymore. It's just a load of wank. That's good. Like I said, um, to me, I was going to nightclubs, so of course I was listening to tracks like um, Twilight Zone, you know, and and all of this sort of stuff. Um, pop up the volume, pop up the volume. Yeah, all of that sort of stuff because that's what the nightclub DJs were playing. But I didn't really buy them. They were I did buy albums like compilation albums, and there'd be the odd one on there, like the now. Now that's what I call music range. I'd buy possibly the odd one of those. Um, probably, you know, because it was given to me as a present, really, more than anything. Um, I find the electronic side of things fun, but the hip hop, rave, drum and bass, I still hate it now. I just wish it'd go away. If there was a wish that you could give, me to say if you could eradicate certain types of music what would you eradicate it would be 80 percent of what i've just read out <laughs> because Unwrap. i felt i felt where the, there was an excitement in the other years of all these different types of genres and the different types of sounds that they were all using this just turned into a flat waste you know i mean drum and bass so eliminate every other thing about it just hear the drum just hear the bass that is something is it uh, before i had that incorporated with other stuff that's what i want because it made sense to me it's like what the hell's this crap i could have i could buy one of those cheap keyboards and put the little drum machine on and i'd have what they were coming out on cd and they were still charging 14.99 for the benefit of it no bollocks i'm a bit like you so thank you very much for that block. And uh, we now have to ask you those important questions, don't we? Which is a uh, favorite tune of this period, which is going to be interesting. I think it will probably be a metal one based on what you've just said. Uh, TV, film or both. Um, I will put a link underneath after you've given your answer. We'll pause for five seconds and then we'll move on to the next block. So over to you, Nigel. Um, there's two songs I want to give. 
Um, the first one I'm going to give Iron Maiden, bring your daughter to the slaughter because it was their first and only UK number one single. It went straight in at number one. It was released um, Christmas Eve, and then the following week, New Year's Eve, bang, straight in at number one. Um, it's not their greatest, but I was just absolutely buzzing. Um, probably for a favourite song of that time period, because it, I used to have it on repeat. Um, I want to go with Enter Sandman Metallica from 1991. A film. Wow. Um, 91 to 94. Yeah, also remember here, you talked about laser discs, so it might make it a little bit easier, you know, if you start. A lot, a lot of mine were mid, more like mid 90s. Um, 90, 90. Yeah, 91, 2, 3, and 4. I'm going to go. With the one I think of straight off his basic instinct. Did you want to do a TV or are you happy with that answer? TV, uh, bottom. Fantastic. Rick Mail and Adrian Edmondson. Yeah. And it's yeah. funny because I was watching that last night on UK Gold. <laughs> and it's still <laughs> funny to this day. It was the one where they sold all the chess pieces and he, for money, and he went, "Oh no!" Because he destroyed the telly and said we were going to have a we were going to have a a night of just uh, talking to each other and all of this sort of stuff. And he tried to teach him chess. Oh, it's gr classic stuff. And um, then it turns out there was nothing wrong with the telly; he just done it to fool him. Yeah, hid it behind the. I don't know how he hid it behind the fridge, but that's where it was. <laughs> anyway. Um, I thought of another question that fits into here because um, with this, I mentioned that Sky and everything was coming up. Um, we haven't really talked about when you bought yours, but one big thing was MTV was definitely around. MTV was a thing. Um, what was MTV to you during this period? Or did you just watch music stuff that was still on the normal terrestrial, um, like the chart show, Top of the Pops, that sort of thing? Yeah, in that time period, never had it, so it was nothing to me. Just used to watch Top of the Pops, and I used to watch a lot of... Um, there was a programme on about one or two in the morning, and I used to set the, the video off to record it. And it was it used to be called The Power Hour, and then they called it Noisy Mothers, and then it got changed to Raw Power. And it was just all like rock and metal, so that, that's how I found out some of the, the stuff that was coming out. Um, but yeah, that, that was it. I, I didn't have MTV. That's brilliant. Actually, MTV meant nothing to me all through these years. Um, I had Sky and so forth. It was there. Um, I liked listening to my music without any pictures. It's because of the way I was brought up with soundtracks, classical music. You were you sat down or had some headphones on, and you just cleared your mind and just listened to it. A picture sometimes distracted me. I was never, I although, although I always thought that they were absolutely gorgeous, you know, to have things like Michael Jackson's Thriller, and it, it's a very technical, great piece, and it's it, it sealed in history on where it is. Um, again, I liked listening to my music with either a friend discussing it or just my own, just listening to the instruments and the words and so forth. Distract. I thought. Uh, video distracted an awful lot to me um but obviously it was the, if sometimes if i was swimming through channels I'd, I'd sit back and watch half an hour of it um but yeah top of the pops the chart show um there was something on saturday that used to be on channel four where they used to use graphics at the bottom to give you some detail about about it, it I, I think that was i'm pretty sure that was called the chart show um yeah that, that, was, bell. that, that, that was my thing and like you say, you come in from a nightclub, you'd have things like um, the tube and all this sort of stuff, repeats. Uh, there was a, a Euro channel. There was a European thing that was a load of shit. <laughs> you came in from a nightclub. I never did. Yeah, I never so went. You never did. 
so that's that that's where as we become adults we diverse a little bit and that's where the commonality has started to go away and that's what makes these questions harder and while some of the things i'm talking about that affected me didn't happen to you for another five years or even ever so we're going to now move nigel to 1995 but we're going to pause for five seconds um before doing that to give people the chance to click on the links that will be in the description below so i'm going to shut up again for five seconds Sod that, that's five seconds. Right, <laughs> we're going to go between 1995 and 1999 with the news again. Boys and girls, you're getting an education. Um, in 1995, this is sad, Rumbelow's department store closed with 311 stores and 3,000 jobs. That was a big what? store, right? Uh, Princess Diana was interviewed by Martin Bashir in that year. Well, 1996, John Pertwee dies, age 76, shortly after the Doctor Who movie was broadcast. Now, that's important to a number of Doctor Who fans, but the thing about it was um, there'd been eight or nine years of no Doctor Who, and they put at the end of that movie showing uh, this is dedicated to John Pertwee, which I always thought, therefore, was worth mentioning in that particular section here. Um, in this particular year as well, Charles and Diana are officially divorced. Uh, 1997, Channel 5 is launched in the UK. Tony Blair is PM under Labour. Um, the Sunderland Stadium of Light opens. Don't know if that means anything to you, but the Stadium of Light in Sunderland states uh, opens. And in 1997, at the um, in this period, Princess Diana is killed in a car accident in Paris. Handle in the Wind becomes the second biggest single ever, ever sold. Uh, sad thing, 1997. 1998, the Good Friday Agreement is signed. Uh, the DVD format is, is launched in the UK. Jumanji wow. is the launch title in the UK. Jumanji is the UK launch title. 1999, the euro currency is launched. So that word, the euro, suddenly started to become a thing. Mm -hmm. Stanley Kubrick died at 70. Wow. Uh, Rod Hull died at 63. Um, uh, fixing an aerial, I believe, is the Yeah, story. silly old bastard. He couldn't be bothered paying for somebody to come and do it for him. Yeah, and Ernie Wise died at 73 a couple of months later. Wow. Wow. The Midland Bank revamped itself and renamed itself HSBC after over 163 years of being called the Midland Bank. I didn't know that. 163 years it was called the Midland Bank. Um, I didn't know HSBC came from the Midland, actually. That's news to me, that one. Yeah, and a booklet was sent to everybody in the UK explaining how the Millennium Bug might affect you. That's 1999. So with all of that in your memory, and it was quite a lot to take in there. Um, the first one, again, I'm pretty sure it's going to be. Um, <laughs> Britpop reached its height in 1995 to 1997. Were you a fan and your thoughts on Britpop? I fucking hated it. Um, years later, I did come to appreciate Oasis more, and I did actually buy some of their stuff on CD. I don't really listen to them now, but even now, there's still the odd Oasis song that I do like. Um, I absolutely despise to this day, and I'm un it's unfortunate to say they're still going pulp. That so called singer they've got is, um, there's not a single song I liked. Um, even Blair, I think they were a bit shit, but at least there was a couple of songs I liked. Um, for me, it was just so over, over hyped. I mean, it's very basic when you listen to. To a lot of Oasis stuff, and I, I, ne I just never got the attraction. It was, however, 
Give me that more than that all that hip hop and dance crap though any day. That's brilliant, Nigel. Like I said, it's nice to get a different thought on things. When I, whenever I whenever somebody mentions Britpop to me, um, and I think about this particular period in time, I remember that I was starting to come to the end of working in pubs because I was working for the same company that I had done for years and years and years. But for me to go to night school, I had to pay for night school because it was something that you know you you had to pay per session. Um, and so I was working in night, uh, working in pubs, mostly um, Irish pubs, but there was the odd odd one that wasn't. Um, and so um, I was listening to music that was in jukeboxes, and all the time it would be Oasis and Pulp and Keen and you know all of that sort of stuff. And there was the odd track that I thought because because you're working and you're taking orders off of people. You only really hear the the bass or the subliminal, you know. You're not you, you're not really taking it in. And there was a there was I was learning a lot about chord changes. You know, I was going, wow, oh, that 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 actually is quite nice. It's actually quite pleasant. When I actually then did get time to listen to it on the radio, I went, what a pile of shit that was because they just they just overpiled it with with overdubbing shit. I thought I thought they overengineered Britpop far too much. That's my opinion. Um, but I do remember that I did go to um, Nebworth and, you know, there was a number of things there and I still got a program from them. And I, I don't feel bad that I went to like an Oasis concert. Um, you know, I, before, you know, the concerts I was going to before were out in John and that sort of stuff. And so it was nice to see something a bit different and, and that it's just, I think Britpop to me was a sign of a, a slight sign of a quality coming back in when you consider rave and all that sort of shit, which I basically just alienated me for four years. So at least there was something that was the odd thing. I'm just glad that I had soundtracks all the way through this and classical and another mediums, you know, piano music out, John, all of that sort of stuff, because if I didn't have those, it'd be silence. That's pretty much how I sum up Brit pop to me. Um, so thanks very much for giving us your answer on that. Um, it doesn't surprise me. It probably doesn't surprise any of the people that know you either. But I think it's good to clear the air, you know, on, you know, uh, by the way, if you're ever thinking about sending something to Nigel, don't do drum and bass. Don't. I think we've got the picture now on the. Uh, what 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 to like and what not to like and this is a, another reason why we're doing this by the way <laughs> you're learning a lot more about nige now the next thing is i mentioned dvd did you move to dvd early um or was it a little bit later on and can you remember what um you probably got a title with the player that you bought from the shop that you got it from or you might have you know i don't know but it's just to cast you back 1998 was the dvd player format being launched so over to you on your thoughts on dvd and what your title was and you know on that media what what it meant to you you know yeah got it fairly early uh 1999 got the first one um from Woolworths of all places um, and I think the reason I wanted it there and then is not only it was a Samsung but it was like for a DVD player at the time it was really cheap um, and I used to go to this shop in Stockton called Popcorn who used to sell a lot of dodgy under the imported US laser discs um, and I went in this day and I was like, what the hell's that? And I think it was Scream. Dot DVD. I went, can you play that on your laziness play? I was like, the tiny? Looking at the cover. And to the other side of a CD, I was like, what? I said, can't be as good as laser. Oh, it's better. And I'll, oh, that was it. I wanted one. So um, she was the one who told me, the boss of this place. She said to me, the Wolves have got one now. She went, and it, you, you can type a code in to make it multi-region. And I was like, oh, one, one. I didn't realise at the time that there was actually quite a few discs out there were region free. Um, so I went and got one, and the film 
well you got two films with it actually on dvd you got i love this film you got brassed off and you got the shawshank redemption but as soon as we bought that went straight back to that shop and the first dvd i ever bought and i do still have it to this day there's a company in the states called elite entertainment and i think they eventually were bought out by anchor bay and i got the original it is as well as just um loved dvd um and that was when the decline of buying laser discs started as well that's brilliant there was a little bit of a stutter there i think things are starting to break up a little bit but don't worry about it too much at the moment but yeah that was that's interesting because you mentioned evil dead and i remember um watching that film and then i still had a, i had a computer so there was an evil dead game and it was done by palace um I remember I've, that. I've, actually, I've actually i've actually spoken to the programmer of that i've got his signature as well that i needed to give to you but unfortunately it would have been just a facsimile of a signature and i thought you wouldn't want it but i've still got it here if you need it um but yeah interesting times the dvd player to me was like you actually 1999 because that was the year i moved to manchester so it was the year that i carted a lot of my life to manchester and i therefore bought a new tv and new new equipment and one of those new equipment was the actual dvd player and it's funny that you mentioned samsung because so was mine later on i did buy a sony um the samsung didn't last too long uh, but again the hack comes to mind um yeah so you had to just um press a, a number of key sequences while it was powering up or when the disc was just going in or whatever and it would turn it multi-region um laser disc enterprises were selling dvds uh, they told you about those hacks um and of course my internet moved to cable so my broadband was a lot faster so of course i learned about all sorts of things that you could do um with, with hacks on remote controls and all that sort of stuff by going on the internet so i was going now into a what they call av forums audio video forums and basically looking at all the players and seeing what hacks you could do all sorts of stuff so great memories there um so thanks very much um so the next question again is another sort of like technical one widescreen tvs became popular did you own one in this period did you move from um a crt type old style tv to a newer lcd type panel a little bit or was that in the 2000s you got to remember there is a there is a period piece that moves from crt to these flat panels even if they were still chunky um so i just wanted you, your thoughts really on widescreen and whether you were now buying widescreen tvs do you remember the old pan and scan what a nice what a nice memory when i think of pan and scan but what a what a cheat that we were only getting 50 percent of the film all sorts of shit going on but uh over to you with your memories um first if you can call it widescreen um tell you was a toshiba with you got a speaker either side for stereo. but where you see like the wide screens now they weren't like quite still quite prominent they weren't like massively wide they were still sort of like just a little bit wider than your normal square that weren't hugely different um and the back on this thing was huge and it weighed a ton still um i think after that one after that one died i'm sure we got a sony a big silver sony one bigger screen with an as just as huge back i can't even remember where we got that from i can't remember it was second hand or where we got it from curry's like reduced because it was like end of the line something tells me it was curry's um but both were nothing nothing like what 
you get now. The screens were nowhere near as what you can get now. Nowhere near as big. Um, but at the time, it was like, my God, this looks amazing. And sounded fantastic compared to the old little mono bubble screen ones. So, yeah, that, that probably got the first one. It was it would have been in the mid to late 90s, I think. That's brilliant. Yeah, like I said, I think mine fits yours. I had a silver Philips, and it was one of the first Philips widescreen TVs, and that definitely had the, sp the speakers on the left and right. It even had to have its own special stand. It weighed so much. Um, it had this sort of like tiered, it had these sort of like silver legs with glass tray where your player could actually fit under and all this sort of stuff. And it, but you needed two people to lift them. If you, if one person lifted that, well, yeah. you're, you're Arnold Schwarzenegger in my eyes because uh, that that's pretty much my memory. Um, but I do remember that it also introduced something else to me that had already been around for quite a while, and that was. NICAM stereo, which was the ground based um, terrestrial stereo signal. So, if you did have stereo or a hi fi connected to your TV, um, you were now getting at least a stereo uh, sort of like two channel stereo from normal BBC One and BBC Two and ITV. And there was even a little symbol for NICAM for a period mm -hmm. of time. So that was great. Now, the next one is, is a computer one, so we, we could probably skip it. Uh, but the next question is, handheld gaming took off. I don't know if you know about Game Boys and all of this sort of stuff. They were a huge thing in this period. Did you try them yourself? Did you have friends around them? Did you own one yourself? Um, I, did, I didn't have a Game Boy. No, I think one of my kids got one, one of the black and white ones. Uh, we did used to have a little cheap or handheld, um, which was basically an earlier black and white version of Tetris. Used to play on that, um, but again, didn't really have any interest in them. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm pretty much, I think we, we, we've grown that, to you, computers have been a function rather than something that yeah. is uh, an entertainment centre. Uh, that might change a little bit later on when you explain later on, because I do know that you're a big fan of one little purple dragon, but we'll talk about that yes. a bit later on. <laughs> um, but the last question of this period, and then we basically move on to um, another block like this, but then the last block will just be really your thoughts. Okay, so we re we really quite moved through this one quite well. Um, the last question is, did you buy hobby magazines? Now, this is where I'm talking about a film magazine specifically, NME, a music magazine specifically, Fangoria, a horror magazine specifically, um, et cetera, et cetera, which would booster your hobby. Um, and, you know, and then you you bought it religiously month by month because that was your thing. Do you see what I mean? Because you were heavily into that. So there might have been a heavy, magazine, a heavy metal magazine. I don't know that. Um, so over to you with your thoughts on that and, whether you've still got them, uh, whether you missed them, <laughs> all of that. Because the internet has pretty much wiped magazines away. They're really, we're talking about here, even now, I think people that are born in the millennium are uh, only just remembering magazines because they are not a thing, really, anymore, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I used to um, get Kerrang! quite regular, which is a sort of heavy metal magazine um and i would definitely get it if it had anything um with these fellas in um there was another one called raw which my photo was in once <laughs> um nme and sounds i used to get those every now and again in the 70s when there were the big black and white newspaper types um they used to do the most amazing full page adverts for new albums and singles that were coming out. I miss those. I wish they still did that. Internet destroyed that as well. Plus, they went glossy and then I just didn't even bother after that. Um, I think that was probably pretty much it. I did get Kerrang! a couple of times, um, but because it was imported from the States, it was just so expensive. Um, couldn't always afford it. The only thing I've ever really 
sort of definitely got every single month without missing and without stopping. Uh, it was a bit later on. It, I think it started around, I don't know, 2003 or four, and it was that Carry On series. It's the only one I've been like really persistent with. No, that's brilliant. Like I said, it's it's always good to get an idea of things because magazines. I was buying computer magazines. I was buying music magazines. I bought Starburst. I even bought Fangoria, and that's because I was going to horror festivals, right? So they'd tell me about special mm. cinemas that were showing seventy-two hour film festivals and all sorts of stuff. And of course, I I hung around with friends that were into all of that sort of stuff so you've sort of followed suit i was probably more a follower than a pioneer <laughs> if they were doing it i was doing it you know it was it was to fit in it's that that thing in me that we that you know where i i can sort of like tell you and during this broadcast that i was a very timid and nervous person i really wanted to fit in i believe my people pleasing probably stems from around here because there were people that I looked up to that I went, oh, he's so cool. He's wearing this. He's wearing that. He listens to this. He's watched that. To me, I thought my hobbies were boring. They're not going to be interesting to girls. What are you, you know, if you, when you're talking to a girl or something, I'm pretty sure she's not going to be interested in the fact that you played Tetris for three hours yesterday. Not the sort of thing that a girl wants to hear about. So, you know, I, I, I sort of like did read up so that I could probably do what I call a, a dummy thing, you know, the dummy's guide to, you know what I mean? So that I had something to talk to girls about. What I don't know what to talk about. So, you know, it was it was as simple as that. So we get to the end, and you know that what that means, uh, Nigel, to you. Remember that DVD was big to you here, so that might help you with the movie or the TV or whatever it is side of things. But tune, film, TV. And then I'm going to ask you an extra one. We haven't talked about gigging. Can you, um, in this block of period between 1990 and 1999, can you bring in a standout gig that you went to? Because I'm pretty sure you went to one. Oh, right. Song, I'm going to pick one off. It's going to be the studio version. Um. It's from 1995, and it is an Iron Maiden song. It's called Sign of the Cross. Um, and it was when Bruce Dickinson left, and they got their new singer in Blaze Bailey, who got absolutely slaughtered. A massive chunk of Maiden fans. Bra loved his stuff. Sign of the Cross being one of my favourites by him and one of my favourite Maiden songs. Um, a film between... 90. Well, I'm, I'll go from 95 because I did one from 91 and 95. Um, the one that sticks in my my head, well, there's two, uh, absolutely blew me away and I've seen them both at the cinema. There was one in 1996, which was From Dusk Till Dawn. And then a year later in 97, um, Scream, the, fir the first West Craven Scream. That absolutely blew me away. Uh, gigs in in the nineties, I was at quite a lot. Um, I was at the final Iron Maiden one with Bruce Dickinson at Pinewood Studios. That's the one where I was. I'd be photo in the magazine and I was on front row of the DVD at the right knob, skinny little runt. Um, I also saw the original reunited lineup of Kiss with the full makeup on and everything. Um, in Finsbury Park in London. Um, that was quite emotional when they came on as well, because I've, I, again, like I made and I've liked Kiss since 1981, since I've gone into all that type of stuff. And for that original lineup to get back together and put the makeup back on was like something we never thought would happen. Um, so the two standout 90s gigs for me are probably that I made one. And that kiss one in ninety seven. The Iron Maiden one was ninety three. That's smashing. I'm I'm so glad I thought about that because all the time we were talking through this, I was thinking to myself, so he doesn't go nightclub in. He might go to the pub or so forth. Work might be stopping him. 
there must have been something that he did. And I remember he's into Iron Maiden. I bet you any money, he probably went to a lot of gigs. He was probably into the music scene that was probably live band, bands playing in pubs, um, went to big shows, gigs, and that's what he saved his money up to get. He's probably got a ton of merchandise. He probably looks at his um, programs from there, got the T-shirts, all of that sort of stuff. Because I remember that my growing up period in the 80s, which I always said to you, 80s is my growing up period. I went to Live Aid. I went to the Freddie Mercury uh, the, wow. the concert. Elton John, you see, was in both. So you can imagine this is what I was following. Um, and, of course, I was then leaving home and going to places that I hadn't done by myself. And you got to, I didn't start doing that until I was like 15 or 16. So you can imagine 1985, 86, I saw the Coventry um, FA Cup final where they won and beat Tottenham. These were my growing up periods. And of course, I have seen out John all the way through these um, 90s. But this is about you, not about me. So I'm glad that I brought gigging in just so that you had the opportunity to say, do you know what? When I think back at that concert, yeah, that was my favorite concert. And you had a, a chance to tell people what it was about it, you know. So you got Kiss and uh, you got Iron Maiden in there. So that's absolutely spot on. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, so I've got I've got a lot to do now because uh, I've got to try and find only the studio recording. Well, thanks very much for making my life difficult, Nigel. I've got to Absolute now search for the it. It's there. It's there. Don't worry about it. It's just a when, when you hear that song now, um, because they did a live version when Bruce Dickinson came back, people always like, go to that, that one. It's not the same. It's got to be the Blaze Bailey one off the X Factor. Yeah, so I will try and do my very best and not cock it up whatsoever. Um, I now keep quiet for five seconds. I turn the page. We are now moving forward into the millennium. So five seconds. I swear it's getting shorter, but, you know, there we go. Um, I now turn over. And we're we're now entering another decade. It is now the news between 2000 and 2004. Okay, so the year 2000. And we're not talking about your favourite band, The Pulp. <clears throat> right. The Millennium Dome is opened by the Queen. Uh, Dr. Harold Shipman um, is sentenced to life. Wembley Stadium closes after 77 years. The Queen Mother wow. celebrates her hundredth. Uh, Queen Mother celebrates her hundredth birthday. In 2001, Labour win the general election for the second term. So they're now Tony Blair is still there. Al Qaeda attacks uh, on the Twin Towers happened in 2001. I think everybody knows that one. Um, I think even um, people, you know, that are in their um, early years know that this atrocity occurred. Um, 2002, the Queen Mother dies, aged 101. But also, a couple of months later, Princess Margaret died, aged 71. That's the Queen's sister, if, I've, if I remember rightly. But in that year, with all those deaths in the in the royal family, the Queen celebrated her Golden Jubilee. Uh, in 2003, the London congestion charge is introduced. <laughs> That's a nice thing to happen, isn't it? Um, weapons of mass destruction debacle begins. So I don't know if you know this. This, I think, was the start of while well, Tony Blair didn't go a third term. But that's ahead. We're going too far ahead at the moment. 2004, fox hunting is banned in the UK. Um, the Indian the Indian Ocean tsunami occurred on Christmas Day. Uh, Boxing Day. It was Ooh. between Christmas Day and Boxing Day that tsunami occurred. Um, and believe it or not, Just Lose It, which is an M&M track, is the first official digital number one. So now we've got a digital chart. CD singles are now starting to become not a thing in sales. And Eminem's Just Lose It is the number one single in that year for the digital chart. 
little bit of education here, kids. Just bringing it in. I wish the ad um, just lost it. <laughs> so here we go. Questions. Um, again, probably technical, just will bypass if it is. I'm going to say, state this, right, in the year 2000. Already this area is the height of powerful game consoles. So we've got the Dreamcast, the PS1, the PS2, the Xbox. These are huge, powerful, very, very much in the news consoles. Did you buy one? Or did somebody buy you one? What were your thoughts on these game consoles that were becoming media centers, basically? Uh, the only console personally had uh for christmas 98 i got a, a a playstation and then after i'd it in christmas my next girlfriend bought me a ps2 the smaller one um apart from that and again it was <laughs> i was just all i wanted to play was spyro the dragon uh, I did try Resident Evil. Um, it was too difficult. I got to a bit where I, I jumped out of my skin, scared the shit out of me. Um, but the fact it was just too difficult, I didn't know what I was doing, made it boring, so I stopped. Um, but that was then I found out that the stuff that I liked was was labelled as platform games. I was like, what's a platform game? So somebody explained, I went, they give them these stupid names. Um, but yeah, Spyro the Dragon and uh, Crash Bandicoot. Never, ever, ever was interested in Xbox or anything like that. It was I, I, I originally wanted a PlayStation because there was an Iron Maiden game coming out called Melt. When they released a best of called Best of the Beast in '96, it had a dirty great big sticker on advertising coming soon. The the, the computer game Melt, and it was going to be on PC or PlayStation. So I got I got the PlayStation for Christmas, um, and while we were in Toys R Us, there was Spyro the Dragon. I had a little go. I was like, "Oh, I like this." And then the following year, it, it came out that Melt was not didn't release it at all. <laughs> so if it hadn't been for Spyro, the Dragon, I, was, I was a bit annoyed, but I'd found Spyro. So no, that's great. Um, like I say, it's it, it. The question sometimes might mean nothing to you, and we move on, and all of that sort of stuff. This is just because this was a huge thing in this particular period. Um, there is a seven-year, or I think six or seven-year gap between a PS One and a PS Two, and media centers became a thing because people wanted a game system and a combined DVD player. So with the advent of DVD, not only did you get higher games because you could you could store more data on them, but you could also play your DVD films through them. So the media mm. center started to become a word again um, in most people's households, and they thought, well, I can get rid of my DVD player now, put my Xbox there, and my kids can play on that, and then when I want to watch a film at night, I can put a DVD film in, and I've got one device that does it all. So you can imagine... And then the other thing that we haven't really talked about is, is that um, they were quite easy to, uh, 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 and, I, and I say this tongue in cheek, copy games still, right? People with PCs bought themselves what they call CD writers and DVD writers during this period of time. So, you know, again, piracy. Um, you could basically get a game, dump it, record it onto a DVD, etc. DVD films also you could get. The high speed of the internet meant that you could download them, so you didn't even have the protection on them anymore, so basically any player could, could actually play them. Um, it was a boon. This was a period of time where I was going to PC World and buying spindles of discs. I bought hundreds, you know, a spindle of a hundred and I would be then just burning, burning, burning. And these, this is when suddenly my CD wallets became a thing. I was putting them into four into wallets and turning the pages over like a like a catalog of films and games uh, because I had no space to put all the boxes that you would need to need to do 
you know, for this. So happy memories for me, probably less so for you, but it was a big eye-opener because I learned about how discs are made up, how they're recorded, protection, all sorts of stuff. So to me, it was a big, a big thing. So moving on to a more music oriented thing and something that might make you smile or it might make you cringe. The iPod, the iPod was launched, okay, during this period. So MP3 and compressed music media files became a thing. That meant downloading music, Napster was a thing for streaming and getting your music. Did you ever have an iPod or similar MP3 type player during this period? Um, and I take it you moved away from the Walkman when this and your CD player when this occurred. Uh, I think it was it might have been a bit late. I, I didn't have an iPod, but I had a Sony MP3 player with a, a, a screen and everything, and then. When that died to death, I got another Sony player. And then it was only, a, like, it must have been about 2016. I finally got my first time as, as they were, like, phasing out. I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm not one for streaming. I don't have LimeWire. Uh, sorry, LimeWire. LimeWire I used to use to download because it was free. I don't, I don't have Spotify or anything like that. It doesn't interest me. Um... But yeah, I, I do have an MP3 now that I, I mainly use for the car, to be honest. Was Napster a thing for you? No. Um, the only thing I used, it was it was LimeWire. Um, but you'd have to be careful because it was just Virus City. Brilliant, yeah. Um, just to give people a history lesson, Napster was between 1989 and 2002 and was a heavy news story during this period because um, the music industry hated it, um, wanted it gone. They did absolutely everything that they could to make legislation against it. Um, but what they actually did was they sued the guy, you know, and, and the people that made it, but then bought the platform for their own platform, which is why you've now got Spotify and so forth. It is Napster wrapped up in a different name. That is all Napster is. So even now it's here. But my days of Napster were quite fond. You know, it was like, oh, I can get that. Or I'm having that, 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 that. It cost me absolutely nothing putting it onto a disc. Yeah, I, I was happy as Larry. Learning later on that the data was compressed and that you were losing a lot of fidelity, you know. Um, your ear can pick up only so much. But it's amazing that when I listen to my early MP3 files, because I've still got them, and then listen to an MP3 file now or a FLAC file, the difference is night and day. And yet back then I would have said, that's cutting edge. What a brilliant. Didn't know. You know what I mean? It's something that you learn, and it's just night and day now. So... Um, I'm pretty sure you that one of my band songs is actually on um I think one of my band songs is actually on Spotify now. I have it because I think one of the uh one of the lads out of the band did it. I'm sure it's there. But to me it's like yeah, I've, it, got, it, I've got the file. Yeah, it's a lovely platform because they do really heavily promote indie bands. I think this is. I think YouTube is the explosion for that. But I do. I yeah. do think that um, um, people like Amazon and that, you know, Prime do heavily promote local bands to get them their start. They've got no record deals. Um, listen to this. It's the band of the week or whatever. Because I think radio now is now totally transformed. From my opinion, worse. Um, yeah. But you know, there we go. So I just want you to end on your final thoughts when it comes to digital music. Um, good thing, bad thing, indifferent, don't care. Um, final thoughts on that, because we're moving away from the iPod now and now into something else. I think it's bad. Um, 
yeah, but um, the music industry now is just turned to shit. Um, the bands don't really see that much of it. Bands nowadays seem to have to rely on touring, but predominantly the merchandise, because they see very little what the music um, makes. I it all goes to the record companies, the big wigs, the greedy bastards like Warner Brothers, Universal, apparently one of the worst. Uh, I record a song on CD or tape, send it into a record company with the hope that one of them will sign them. I'm glad vinyl's come back, but again, it is still all, the, the big majority of stuff is digital. However, vinyl, I'm sure vinyl beat digital in sales, was it last year or the year before, which is a really good thing. But, but for me, downloading stuff and streaming music should never ever have become a thing unfortunately as there's nothing we can do about it but i think it's bad yeah so i think you know my thoughts on this i'm a big physical person you know in stature and in what i collect um i streaming is the lazy option it's the option that they want us to go down but i don't want to go down it it's the root of your renting, not actually owning anything. It's the, um, the, it's almost like censorship in the fact that I want to listen to something. You're saying I can listen to it now. And then you're saying at any point, I can take that away from you. You are not my dad. You are not my mum. As far as I'm concerned, that's mine. Um, it is that legislation law that is a gray area. Um, as far as I'm concerned, until I die, I will be physical media. Anybody that mentions streaming to me, I look at it as being the easy option, the option that works for you. And I've got no problems. And I'll and I'll and people that love streaming are my friends, and I and and they and they are friends with me. We don't fight about it. It's just we have two different yeah. opinions about it, um, and 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 that's the diversity of the hobbies that we're in um it's just it's just the way it is but anybody that knows me will know i will fight physical media till till i till my dying day the other idea that uh, i've got about this is is that my mum is still prominent now okay and she's 83 as technology moves forward and remember i'm a big techie the downside of techie is that it alienates my mum I mean, just think, she used to have records, and she understood that. I introduced her to the CD player. She understood that. All of a sudden, she couldn't. She had to have MP3 players that she couldn't get her head around, and now I have to teach her things like um, Alexa and so forth, you know, which I don't want to mention too loud. Um, but what I'm trying to say is, is my mother doesn't understand it, and she doesn't understand it to the point where she says now... She, she, she stop. She now says, um, "Stop, please." And I'm I'm going out now. Bye. So she talks to the device, thinking it's a person because she doesn't understand. God. See, she she she's the type of person that says, "Will you play this, please?" Not play it now. You know, it's, please, thank you. I'm off to the shops now. She doesn't understand. She thinks she has to tell the device that she's off somewhere. I mean, I can't get my head around that. But that, that, she doesn't understand. And she doesn't also understand that her money is coming when she gets her pension and she gets it at the post office, that it's coming from her bank. She thinks her money's at the post office. She doesn't understand why she needs a pin. Why she's got to remember a pin when she's right next door to the post office. Don't you have it in the back there? That is my mum. You know, my dad understood it probably a little bit more. But this is where the son becomes the parent. And I've never been comfortable with that. And that's my little backstory in regards to that. So we're getting to the last two questions of this period. And then we're going to be moving on. Um, they're pretty much sort of similar similar to each other um this is something that was big in this period again nigel so don't worry about it if you didn't do anything did you did you buy part works bi-weekly magazines live from eagle moss 
Um, and when it comes to your book um, stuff, did you tend to find that as we're now in this period of time, 2000 to 2004, if you did buy a book, it was more likely to be a reference book than it would be a novel or something. It would probably be more about a reference book on films or a reference book on music, like the history of number ones for 50 years and all of that sort of stuff. Those two things are combined, and then we move on. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm really enlightening to hear this this particular part. Um, yeah, if I, if I got any books, it was mainly it'll have been either to do with films or music. I do remember, um, again, my girlfriend at the time got me a, an Iron Maiden book, and it was like story of them called Running Free. Um, don't have one of them. And getting less of them as well. I didn't really get many at all books at all. Again, apart from that. Oh, you broke up a bit there, Nigel. Say again. What was the other part of the question? Oh, it was the Eagle Moss bi-weekly stuff. You know, the horrible part work stuff where it is buy this at 2 99 for the first issue, then it's a 5 99 for the second issue, and then it's 9 99 for 90-odd issues. It's going to cost you three grand, and basically yeah. what you get at the end is some uh, some piece of shit that basically doesn't fit together properly. No, to get any of them. The, the, like I said earlier, the only one I ever got was the um, D'Agostini carry-on collection. Um, you got a magazine and a DVD, and you got the entire lot, except for Carry On Columbus, and I've still got them. I've, like, I've already done a video on them. They're the same ones that I had then. That was about 2004, 2005, something like that. No, that's brilliant. Um, I was a big thing on part works because basically Marvel Comics was part of that, and I was buying little figurines. I know it's a nerdy thing, but I like you bought part works of DVDs. I didn't get the carry-ons because I bought box sets of those, but I did buy the Clint Eastwood collection. It came in a magazine and it was all the Clint Eastwood films and they all had the same spine all going along. All of the Clint Eastwood films on DVD came out every two weeks. Spot on. Loved it. Um, I'm a big hater of part works. I wish they'd go away. They went bust last year, uh, but another company has taken them over. You see them all the time. Build the Back to the Future DeLorean, buy the Robocop part works, buy no. the Batmobile, buy this, that, the Starship Enterprise, all this sort of stuff. They come in 99 issues. They cost £10 each. It means it costs you three grand for the luxury of building this thing. And to be quite honest, you could buy a porcelain statue of it for half the price and you'd have it but the companies go bust halfway through. So you only have half the kit. And that's because we live in an age now where you, you have got no guarantee that just because you say you're a subscriber and it's posted to you, that the company is going to survive all the way to the end. And I don't understand why people don't do the math. When the advert comes up and it says a part works in 99 issues and it's going to cost you a tenner, do the math. Not hard. How much that's going to cost you to have a one-sixth scale James Bond car? It's just not worth it. It really is not worth it. It is useless. And the things probably won't fit together. The stuff will go missing in the post. You'll be then phoning up saying, send me another copy of it. You'll never get that copy because they've sold them all out. You'll be looking on eBay for that issue for the next next decade. That's the other thing that will happen to you. So go figure. I, that's my rant over. I need a tune from you, a film from you. <laughs> normal, just like normal, because we've uh, we've reached that period of time, 2000 to 2004, just to remind you. Right. Um... Two thousand and four, saw the film I'm going to go for. Um, blew me away when I saw that at the cinema. 
um, a song from 2000 to 2004. Oh, man. The one that springs to mind is... It will be either Don't Give Up by Chicane with Brian Adams or this bad boy here, which, thank God, they've re-released. It's on the dance floor. I'm going to go for those. Uh, was that it? Just the, was it? Yeah, pretty much. Unless you want to talk about anything like a gig, I mean, or TV. I only brought the gigging in because I wanted to give you the chance to talk about what your favourite gig was. I mean, if you've mentioned what your favourite gig was, there's nothing that's after it that you think is better of it better than it but if you want to talk about something in this period that i haven't asked you a question on phil it's free reign this is you that we're interviewing here so please talk about anything in this period of time that i haven't addressed in a question 2000 2004 um i think most of the stuff that happened in Especially 2004. Um, I, won't, I, I won't dare talk about because it, it is personal. It was like break up and getting on with somebody else type of thing. But it was the year my youngest daughter was born as well. Um, the gigs, no, I, I can't remember the first gig I went to. Oh, I did go and see Iron Maiden in 2003 on the Dance of Death tour. Uh, Two thousand and four. Oh, and in, I, actually, in two thousand and three, I did actually start work at the hospital as well. Changed jobs then. Um, but that's pretty much about it, really. I think. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I suppose when I'm thinking about the of how I can improve this later on, I could actually have um, a question that says a reflection of this period of time because I haven't asked you those. I've relied that the questions will eke it out of you but not realize that technology wouldn't be something that you talk about. So you skip past it. And then, but there's huge chunks of something that would have been going on that would have replaced that. And uh, unless I'd have brought it up, you, you haven't brought it up and I haven't asked you it. So we're, we're still probably got huge, big gaps, but like I say, feel free. If there's a reflection point that you want to talk about, this is, this is an interview about you, Nige, bring it out. You know what I mean? Um, I, I can, I'm sorry, I can only second guess, you know, this a little bit. Um, but I've got your song now. It's interesting, the song part, because in the first 1970 to 74, you came out with a ballad. And then it's been metal, metal, mm. metal, metal, metal. And then you've come out with this one. Can you think of a reason why you actually chose a ballad in this particular period? Because it is something that instantly comes to your mind. So there must be a reason why a Metallica or an Iron Maiden one hasn't come up and that one does. Any history behind why that would be? Um, there weren't, there weren't particularly ballads. I mean, one of that one with Brian Adams and Chicane, that's more of that's like a dance thing. Um, and Murder on the Dance Floor, it sounds like very disco. I don't know what the hell it was. It just... It just resonated with me there was i must admit there was a few sort of dancey things in the early 2000s that i actually did like uh there was another one by danny minogue called who do you love now um oh god there was a few that i liked don't give up as well obviously i can't think of them offhand now oh there was one called uh rapture by io spelled i i o i love that as well um I think it's just probably the memories of it. Like my kids were younger and stuff like that. Um, just thinks of that. Think of that. Um, but not, oh, 9-11, that, that got me bad. I was terrified that day. Um, and to this day, I'm still kind of obsessed with that. I still do think about it. Um, United 93, when that was on the cinema, was the first film that I actually physically 
cried, not filled up, but actually cried too at the end of it. Very powerful stuff. And like everybody else, you always remember what you were doing when you found out and when it happened. It was horrible. Um, and every year when it becomes um, a like anniversary, you always get these never forget. If you were there, you're never going to forget. Unless you were a kid at the time, then they're like, oh, yeah, well, that was then. But like, we're sort of talking 23 years later, and it's like, to this day, it's still absolutely. No, that, like I say, it, it's really good to get an insight on it. And I, I think that, I think that's filled in quite a few gaps as well, Nigel. So, I mean, I think, I think a lot of people will sympathize with that it's also good that you've you've reflected back to a period where you said all of that that you just mentioned shit don't want to hear about it and yet it was dance and yet you've just resonated to a couple of times and said mm. actually when i think back at it there are a couple of things that did resonate with me i can't think of the names of them that's exactly what you just said and yet that was a period where we said oh let's junk it all and i was sort of like agreeing to me, it was the electronic side of things that I liked. I think the tracks that resonated with me were things like The Rhythm of the Night. This is the rhythm of the night, you know, that track. Um, you know, Murder on the Dance Floor is also an electronic one that I like. I was pleased to see that at the, I think it was the Oscars, that she she came on stage where it was our BAFTAs. She had a lovely dress on, Sophie Ellis-Bexter. Anybody that knows as well, Sophie Ellis-Bexter is the famous daughter of a broadcaster that we would have watched as children on TV. Yes. On Peter. Um, so, you know, yeah. So there is, so there is um, a lot of our childhood being seen through those eyes again, when we're looking at their daughters coming through, you're going, wow, hasn't she grown up? Yeah. Hasn't she just bloody hell? I wouldn't mind uh, uh, knowing that yes. person uh, in a, in a sort of a way. So <laughs> knowing I, I that person, <laughs> <laughs> I have to be so right. up before. I mean, we, 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 we know what you're thinking. Anyway, we're now. I mean, look at that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's provocative, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I've got the original. Bonnie, got Bonnie the, woman. I've got the original CD single of that. I've got the actual one that was released this year of that. It just it bookends. I, I like it when things like that happen. Um, it's funny. I just find it funny how. Everything goes round in circles. Everything is a circle to me. Everything's a circle. Vicious circle of poverty, circles um, of uh, media, genres, everything. It just, it just, it just, it just always goes on for me. Sorry about that. Uh, that wasn't me, by the way. That's just your. That's just the internet dropping. That's okay. Streamyard. Yeah, Streamyard. Put it down to Streamyard. So again, the last block where I'm going to be doing news and then questions because the next block will be just all news and you are free reign to talk about anything in that period how you set up your youtube channel everything right so it's a free for all so this shouldn't take too much long and that the next section could be as long or as short as you like because you can reflect about everything we've just done here we haven't talked about watership down animation start thinking in your head you know stuff you haven't brought up that you want your want people to know Right. So, right, 2005 to 2009, Nigel. Right, again, something else here that's not going to resonate with you, but 2005, Doctor Who is revised as a TV show after being discontinued in 1989. That's 16 years it took for that show to come back. Live 8 concert occurred. Ronnie Barker died at the age of 76. Georgie Best died wow. at the age of 59. Charles and Camilla marry. So that's 2005. 2006, BBC Grandstand is cancelled after 50 years. No Grandstand anymore. Wilder Sport died a number of years before that, if you ever remember Dickie Davis. Oh, I... It was the 80th birthday for the Queen Elizabeth II. There you are for our Queen. 2007, the new Wembley Stadium opened. Remember I talked about Wembley Stadium before closing? The new Wembley Stadium opened, 2007. The smoking ban came into effect in all buildings, pubs, wow. restaurants. 
Um, the analog signal for TV was turned off. Good God. Aerial, boom. Now digital. 2008. The new neurovirus bug affects 3 million people across the UK. You remember the neuro bug what? that made you shit and sick? Yeah. And yet, and yet, um, you know, as we go into the, you know, the, the, the pandemic, it could have been, a, you could have thought of that as being a pandemic, 3 million people affected. And I do remember that it actually did affect America and everywhere else. Weird how we didn't consider that a pandemic, but there we are. Boris Johnson is elected mayor of London in that year. Things God. did go downhill in the 2000s. Uh, Russell Brand's prank is a call prank on the radio, causes uproar. I don't know if you know about Russell Brand, but he and he and um, Jonathan Ross played a prank on um, man. You know uh, man, Manuel from Faulty Towers, Jonathan Sachs or whatever his name is. They played yeah. they played a prank yeah. on him, and basically. Um, um, Jonathan Ross was banned from TV so was Russell Brand was banned from t radio and TV wow. Jonathan Ross then had to give up his whole BBC uh, media empire that it created and had to divert to the ITV because of this prank that was heard on the radio just so you go know. um, this is the year by the way 2008 that Woolworths closes 807 stores that was the year that Woolworths went from our High streets. By the way, the MFI stores close as well. That's 111 MFI stores. Remember the MFI? MFI. I forgot about them. Yeah, it's all IKEA now, but MFI was a thing and bang, all gone. So the last bit, 2009, Jade Goody um, enters Big Brother house for the second time, marries her long term boyfriend, but dies a week later of cervical cancer bringing cervical cancer to the masses as a thing that needs to be taken care of by uh, for all women. So a horrible thing and a positive thing. Um, Jay Goody, I never thought anything of her until she died, really. It's very sad. Mm. Um, but I brought that in. Uh, Michael Jackson announces his UK tour, but then dies before the concert. Uh, that's 2009. Uh, and um, ITV's. I'll just get the door. Yeah. So we'll just do a little pause here, folks. So that was the news. Um, we just did a little jump cut there, but um, we're going to go into the questions now, Nigel. So um, iPhone is launched during this period. So probably a lot of my questions are going to be based around that. Um, the iPhone is a is is a massive thing in this period because the touch screen phone became a thing, and the iPhone um, from Apple basically changed everybody's phone. So we've now got camera integration, we've got uh, heart monitors, we've got absolutely everything. Social media, all that stuff is now in a phone. Um, do you remember getting uh, an iPhone or a similar uh, type of phone? Did you own one? Um, thoughts. Thoughts on the phone change from being a, a simple phone that you'd make a phone call on to being an all-encompassing Swiss Army knife of bits and bobs. I've only ever had one phone. I bought it of a mate second hand when I, I desperately needed a phone. Um, and I vowed I'd never have another one. I hate them. Uh, even now, these new People pay a thousand or well, up to a thousand or more pounds for them, but they've only got like an ex they've got like an expected life to start to slow down. Apparently, I've been told that Apple put something in them so they will eventually go. So you have to get the next one. Um, if they're the ones who've started the, the smartphone, yeah, thanks very much. But you can piss off now because Samsung do it so much better. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of like in agreement with you. I'd go one step further that the iPhone is a very important piece of technology and I'll never take anything away from Apple for making it. Um, it's done a lot of good things, a lot of good things, but for everything that it's done good, it's done a heck of a lot of things bad. Um, 
I don't like the fact that I see mothers crossing over crossways with a pram looking at the phone rather than looking at the child or holding the child. Car accidents have, have, have increased because phones are on dashboards. Um, all sorts of stuff that are hindrances to us. I think that the social side of things where we used to go to the pub and see each other is now turned into a Facebook, I can do this over the phone type thing. We've um, it hasn't helped with the pandemic, but it's it's exasperated to the point where um, all we do now is take pictures of our dinners and send that to our to our loved ones to say what we're eating today. And that's another thing that just really annoys me. Um, so, you know, as much as there are a lot of good things, you know, that um, I love the fact that I can do take a picture of something, take a recording of something make the phone call, store all the phone numbers in it, um, all of that sort of stuff. And it's a great memory thing. It's the worst thing in the world that we could ever have introduced to ourselves as well. Um, so, well, you, you do know, meet I, people I, you never I, would have I, met. Yes. So there's good and there's bad. And I would probably say it's a 50-50 split in my, in my mind, but it's the death and, the, and, and that sort of stuff that um really really do upset me you know mothers should be thinking about their children not um looking at a phone and oh i've got to get back because i need to have this chat with someone or um i can't miss this text conversation that's coming towards me you're out it with your child spend time with your child don't think about these things um when i went out with my friends for a drink i made sure my mum and dad were all right when i went out i didn't think about that when i was out there and i knew that i could make a phone call from any phone booth i didn't need a portable device to actually do it yeah. with, you know and they knew that i was safe and the police would contact them if anything bad had happened we we it, it, it's to the ninth degree with phones and that's what upsets me the most but to continue on with phones, and this is the second question of three, um, apps have now become a word. You know, apps is now a word in the dictionary. It's a big thing when it comes to phones. It adds value to a phone. Um, what was the first app that you ever downloaded for your phone, if you can remember it? Or what is your favorite app at the moment? My first smartphone was a sony sony ericsson it was when sony just went to sony um and it had a big wide screen and i'm sure you could slide the top part up was, as well. was, it razor, what it was. Ra was it a razor i remember me so was it a razor it may ericsson, well have been razor proper sony logo um and I remember my mate coming to see me and he said to me, like, um, what apps have you got on that? I went, what are you on about? What apps have you got? I went, I don't know what you mean. What's an app? He tried to explain to me and I couldn't get my head around. I'm going to basically another website then. And it took me a long time to get to sort of grips with what an app actually was. It's, it's me even now it's basically you, you click it and it's just a direct link to a website to a little website but it's done to suit your phone um the ones i use the most good god um I, I use quite a few now obviously i use facebook instagram uh youtube obviously is a massive one i use now um but i use a lot as well for editing photos um i use one called uh, man alive i can't remember what it's called it's basically what i use to make like the thumbnails and any any little bit you might see on my videos come up like when you see the iron maiden logo and stuff like that i use a background eraser as well so if you for instance just wanted that you can put that photo in and you can get that off it and leave the rest. You're better off cutting it like that first. But all, like little things like that that I use a hell of a lot. Um, if I was to pick a favourite uh, 
I would have to go with eBay. No, that, that's brilliant. And I think it adds what I was saying, which is it's amazing how a program as powerful as Photoshop, which is pretty much what we're talking about here, photo manipulation, can be done in a phone. You know, the, the, phone, yeah. the phone has become the Swiss army knife as far as I'm concerned where my granddad would have carried a Swiss army knife around. My dad would have carried a Swiss army knife around, you know, all those screwdrivers and things and knives that he used to bring out. That's what the phone has become. I feel sorry though, that the phone hasn't just become the phone <laughs> that you could just make a phone call from. That's all it is. Um, because I, I, I feel a little bit for the kiddies that some kitty will come in with a phone. They want it. They feel that they're missing out because their friends got it. They're part of these groups and WhatsApps and all of that sort of stuff. And because they're not, they, their mum and dad haven't got the money for it. They have to have the lower grade version of the phone. And um, if all kids could just be given an emergency phone, I would do that because I had to go through school with working out maths without calculators. So why is it that they have to take a, a phone with them to help them with their schooling? When, when they're in class, they should just have an emergency phone on them. It's just the way I am. I'm probably an old grumpy old git, and I don't know my admitting it, but that's how I learn, and I learn a lot, you know, by reading, listening, paying attention to the teacher, not looking at it on the internet, having it by me while somebody's trying to explain something to me. Um, it's not needed as far as I'm concerned. Um, so the last one. And because you've mentioned photo manipulation and we've mentioned just how much of a Swiss army knife is, something that's a bane of my life that I've had through the last 10 years, 20 years, I would say, really, is the capturing of concert footage with a phone. <laughs> <laughs> so with your new phone that you've got, Nige, have you actually used your phone to capture? your footage so that you've got a memory of that gig and have you as, does it get on your nerves when other people are holding up their phones and waving it around to get a recording and not paying attention to what's happening at the gig itself uh yeah i've you um just at one gig um and it was it was iron maiden last year it was last June Leeds Arena. <clears throat> I didn't. I've seen people sit there and they'll record the full thing. And then, however, I do like to get some memories from it, some photos and bits of video footage. I think I recorded a little bit more video footage this time around because I knew I was going to do a YouTube video of it. Um, normally, I wouldn't record full songs. I would just do little snippets and put it on. Uh, Facebook and stuff, but this time I recorded the entire intro to their stage and the first two songs. The reason I did it is because they did a tour of a mixture of the new album and one of their older albums called Somewhere in Time, and everybody, like a massive lot of fans now never ever got to see that tour and it's their favorite album that was the first tour i actually saw them on so when they come on the first two songs they did off that album i had to get it recorded because they haven't played them since like 1986 um and then a bit later on in the gig they played a song that they've never played live ever from that album and all the fans have been going on from that played for years they've just ignored them so this tour they've actually listened to them the songs called uh, alexander the great and I never really used to care for the song. Yet people say it's the best song on the album. But when they did it, my God, it was actually quite emotional. Um, and I captured it on video. Um, and I put it on my YouTube thing. But I've kept the footage on me on me uh, computer. But normally I'll I might stop take a couple of photos and because I like to watch. I, I I couldn't go to a gig and hold my phone up like that for the entire thing like some of them do. That some of them do. 
No, that's brilliant. And I'm so glad that you've told all of the people out there that you've never made a sex video. There is no sex video of Nigel and Laura out there. There is no. <laughs> no, there isn't. <laughs> so that's, I'm sure that's put people's, people's uh, minds at rest. So thanks very much for clearing that up. And as you know, there was a, the there was a couple of clips from from you, a a long deleted before they got to go anywhere. <clears throat> oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> So we need from you. And I'm not telling you to with either. Film, TV. <laughs> you will get this in the end. I need a song from you. I need a film from you, a possible TV. If you want to talk about anything that reflects 2005 to 2009, this is your section to do that in. Um, mm. film. I'm going to go with the remake of The Hills of Eyes. And another film I'm going to go with is The Devil's Rejects, because both of them absolutely blew me away at the cinema. Song, 2005 to 2009. I'm going to go with uh, a song by the Stereophonics called Daisy Lane. That's from 2007. Um, a TV show? I can't. Actually, yes, Dexter. I forgot about that one. Anything else in reflective mood, or should we move on? Uh, that was the year that I got my heart ripped out and trampled all over. That was bad. Um, or just just remember, that really, just remember really... Nigel, you do not you, you do cool. not have to talk or bring up anything that's going to cause you distress or anything. If there's anything that you just want to go, you know, I reminisce and think about that, and I don't feel so bad about it now as I did as I did then, or it still hurts, by all means, just tell us, but you don't feel that you need to go into any detail. You know what I mean? Um, sometimes uh, it, it's nice just to say what the emotion was and end it there. Um, up to you. Well, he interrupted me there, boys and girls, didn't he? So he's put, he's pissed on the right bonfire there. I can't I can carry on now. God, shite, man. Um... Yeah, but it's true. It happened, um, and it killed me. Um, but I met Laura the following year, two thousand eight. Uh, what else? Do anything else happening? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two thousand eight. I was on, after about. Must have been about a week or two. I got together with Laura and my maid. Actually, gave her his concert ticket for the Iron Maiden gig he was going to go with me to see. And he gave it to her, and it was in London. It was at a stadium. Um, wow, what a gig that was. Fantastic day. Um, they're the biggest things that stand out from that period. Well, I'll tell you something that I'd like to know. How, how did you and Laura meet? And um, what was it like, you know, at the... The sudden transformation of, of having something as traumatic as what you've mentioned and then moving into something new and then that growing and then becoming what it is now is it that would have probably happened in a spate of these four years that were going there. I mean, I'd like to know a little bit of background of how you first met and all of that sort of stuff. Maybe a lot of other people would like to know that. Uh, that was a really mental mental yeah so much happened in that year from my girlfriend doing what she did um almost killing me and then i that was in the july and then in the january of 2008 it was when i turned 40. so between sort of her leaving me in the july july august 
a month later, that was what I started to do what I should have done when I was like 16, 17, 18. That was my daft year. That was when I had my first ever one night stand. Uh, I was going to nightclubs. Um, I had an affair with a married woman <laughs> for a week. Uh, it was the first Christmas in 2007 since I was 17 that I was single. Um, that hurt. That was bad. Um, because when I split up with the mother of my kids, like, that's what I got on with, like, pretty quick. Um, and I, I was already sort of in a relationship with her by Christmas. Um, and then after her, she left me, so I was single that one, but then the next one I was with Laura. So that Christmas was horrendous. I didn't like that at all. Um, but when I started to work at the hospital um, in 2003, I started in what they call the sterile services department, you know, where they clean all the instruments that they use in theatres and stuff like that. It was mine and my mate's job. We would, like, go and collect all the used and dirty ones with bits of bone and skull on, take them back to their unit, and then we'd deliver all the clean ones all around the hospital. That was part of our job. And then I used to look at porters and think, I wish we had like some sort of, you know, patient contact because you'd see them having a bit of patter with them. And I was like getting quite heavy to that. And then this day, um, our receptionist said to me, like, there's a job come up for a healthcare assistant. I went, where? And she went, oh, the renal unit. I was like, I don't want to work there. I'll pick up things. And she went, well, just apply for it. You know, I was applying, go for the interview, see how we go. You don't have to take the job. I went, oh, yeah, I could do. Anyway, I did. Um, and it was the manager and one of the senior now, they found out that same day that I got the job. So I accepted it. And I went for it. And they, they told me later on, they went, you absolutely pissed that interview. They said, we're that impressed with you. you. And I was like, why would a fully qualified nurse want to step down to a healthcare? And it was probably less responsibility. They just wanted out where they were. I beat them. And they were probably being in healthcare a lot longer than I was. So that was like 2005 when I, I got that job. And then in 2008, uh, I went in this day. Um, and, um, and a holiday, what they call a holiday patient, I think it was, came in who ended up being a full-time patient. I was going on with the teas and stuff, and I was looking, thinking, oh, hello. And it was Laura. Little did I know, she told me this later on, I'd pushed somebody out of the main entrance, and she'd come in for an appointment. And she'd seen me and said very eloquently to her stepmother, I'd do him. I didn't know this. Um, and then when she came, she said, I couldn't believe it. I went, for dialysis, she had seen you there, I couldn't believe it. And then just started talking, and that was it. We started talking out of work, and I, I just said to her, Do you fancy meeting up one night after work? I went and picked her up, and um, been together ever since. That was 2008. Brilliant. I mean, small stepping stones, amazing how coincidence, how. How, how how life moves forward and out of the blue without you even looking something something happens but i i i i do stress this and it's something that i should take on board myself it can only happen if you if if you go out there if you're not out there in the world nothing's going to happen you stay in one room nobody's going to come and see you you are not out there you're out of sight out of mind which is why i I've yeah. continued to try and push the boundaries a little bit in regards to YouTube, getting my getting out there, being more involved with things, bring people together, um, meet up even um, with people that I've met on here and and, and, and and that sort of thing. Because I think what happens is if if you if you're in the same situation for too long, then it can become um, a warm place and a place that you don't want to leave and it, and it and i also find 
the, uh, want the world I'm in a very claustrophobic place when actually it's I, I've got so much I could be out there in but I just don't do it um and that means that I've something about me has been kicked out of me just like bullying it's been sort of like you've been kicked in the head so many times and you just now rest on your laurels. So I'm just so happy that a traumatic thing turned itself around. And it sounds very much like it was a very holistic thing that occurred as well. I use that word quite rightly as well in the fact that a multiple of things were going on and it just happened. Um, and that's great. Yeah. So it was forced upon you. Nobody introduced you. You were put into a situation of, do I like this? Do I like that? And all that sort of stuff. Just the best way. So happy for yeah. you, mate. Um, I think you've given me the, the songs and everything. So, boys and girls, I'm going to stop for five seconds, and then we're going to go into the last section, which is totally unique and different to what we've done before. Um, I'm pretty much going to be, I think, quiet through it all, which is a miracle as, as far as a YouTube is concerned. Um, so I'm going to shut for five seconds and we'll move on. That's enough. Right. So, um, where I've been doing the decade split into two and, and 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 five years of blocks with questions 2010 and 2013 is now pretty much in our minds right now i think if you, even if you go back to 2010 if i mentioned something that happened in there you'll remember it even some of our youngest friends that nigel and i know um ryan um etc etc will be in their 10 or 11 year old stage now so you know where wow where we've just come from where they've been born in that millennium we're now in the 10 to 13 which means they're between 11 and where they are now which is in their 20s so this is just going to be a very quick news 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 and then i'm going to give nige free reign to expand on those things, talk about life, film, music, TV, um, animation, cartoons, anything he wants, a bit about his YouTube channel, and we wrap it up. Simple as that. That's the end of the interview. So I'm going to talk a lot now, but then pretty much I'm going to be talking not at all, and everybody will be happy. So here we go. Right, I've got no years on these but I've tried to put them in year order from 2010 to 2013, rem re remembering I have to do highlights. There's so much that's gone on, but I've put down highlights. Right. The world's first iPad is released. 22 million watched the wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton, and they have three children in this decade. Osama bin Laden is killed. Documentary by the group Invisible Children went viral asking the world to take action against Ugandan warlord Joseph Kony for human rights abuse. I mentioned that one because of the human rights abuse. It's something that's still going on right now. Equality for people yeah. that are living in all sorts of countries and they're being paid 10 pence. South Korean pop superstar Psy created the Gangnam Style. Um, he he reaches one billion views. He's the first person to reach a billion views. Nelson Mandela died. The Malaysian flight MH370 goes missing with 239 passengers and crew. Unheard of, you would have thought of in the two thousand this this particular period. How can a flight go missing? How many satellites have we got anyway? The Malaysian flight MH17 is shot down flying over Ukraine, Ukraine four months later. How, un, how unlucky is this Malaysian flight airline? They've lost the flight, and then they've got another 200-odd people shot down going over Ukraine four months later. I don't think I'd step onto that flight, uh, that, that, that airline uh, anymore uh, after all of that. 
Um, that particular flight that was that, that was flying over Ukraine, it killed 283 passengers and 15 crew. Wow. The ice bucket challenges introduced, raising 115 million for a for ALS awareness. That's that was a big thing. It was like a viral thing on YouTube, which is why I mention it. And it was for charity. And even I remember the ice bucket challenge. Uh, the Robin Williams suicide raises awareness for mental health. The rise and fall of ISIS. So in 2014, it was the height of the attacks and the suicide bombings. In 2016, 2017, it was the collapse of ISIS and um, the Caliphate uh, dream, apparently. Cal Cal Calafite dream? I don't know. I can't pronounce that very well myself. Um, the next thing, diverse emojis were introduced in 2015. There was no such thing as a different coloured skin emoji up until this point. So they were all pink, or <laughs> there was no white, there was no yellow ones, and so forth. So diverse emojis became a thing. A uh, global climate change agreement is signed and agreed. Legalization of same sex marriage. Greece announced itself as bankrupt. A whole country actually announced itself in this period as bankrupt. It's, one of the, it's in fact, looking back, it's one of the reasons why. We left Europe because we had no control of our money. If a country delegated itself as bankrupt and it was part of Europe, we had to bail them out and we had to supply whatever it for money our country earned to bail them out. So if we hadn't have bailed ourselves out, they would have asked for something like four billion from us. We had no control over it because Germany is the center of the European Union. As far as anybody's concerned, richest country in Europe uh, at the time, anyway. Um, Queen Elizabeth II becomes the longest reigning British monarch ever. So during this period, she crossed the bridge of, ha of having the longest reign of a queen or king. So it's amazing, isn't it, that Henry VIII and Elizabeth I and all of those are all now not the longest reigns known in English history. Yeah. Brexit referendum happens with a 52% majority. <laughs> this was a, a big thing. We woke up and found out that 2% majority meant that no matter what happens, you're leaving. you got no choice. That's a referendum. That's how it works. And people were having a lot of difficulty understanding, but it's 2%. And I'm going, yeah, but that's it. You should have, if you, if if all these people abstained, tough luck. That's why we're out. Um, I didn't need to know what my friends, whether they voted in or out or whatever. I just accepted the fact that you don't do another vote just because you don't like the answer to something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that's pretty much what all the arguments were for the next five years. <laughs> oh, can we reverse this? Oh, now we know what it's like. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, well, what the fuck did you do it for? A laugh. It was a referendum, and it was us that agreed we wanted it. So there you are. You 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 got what you wished for. Anyway, Donald Trump became U.S. president. That scared the world. I think that was the 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 uh, the hashtag yeah, Me did. Too epidemic starts. So hashtag Me Too became a big thing, as did a lot of hashtags. Hashtag was everywhere. It was. Hashtag blame Nigel, hashtag Iron Maiden, hashtag whatever. Everywhere. Hashtag uh, the true royal story. Wedding. Yeah. <laughs> the royal wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan occurred. And the last one, the Epstein scandal occurred and Prince Andrew was interviewed. That is the news between 2010 and 2013. I've mentioned Brexit the coronavirus, all of those sort of things. They're all in that news. Like I say, Nigel, it's a free reign here to expand on any of that stuff if it takes your interest. Otherwise, it's just life, film, music, TV, how you started YouTube, free reign. Because after that, I have got 10 last questions for you. Very, very quick one-word oh. answer questions for you. 
that ends this whole thing. So if you want to make this as short and as long as you want, it's your stage. Where the hell do I start? Um, there's just, I mean, there's a couple of things that I didn't get chance to mention. Just so things like the week after 9-11, exactly a week to the day, it was the following Tuesday. That was when our band first started. Um, I went and auditioned. And they wanted to be back straight away. Um, we broke up a couple of times, got back together, broke up, got back together. So that band has been together on and off for 23 years nearly. Wow. And I remember going for that audition like it was about two years ago. Real band I'd ever been in. I was 33. I didn't dare go for anything good enough. Um, I remember when when Bruce Dickinson in their fan club, they advertised that if you're interested in being Blaze Bailey's bass player, send your tape to this. And my mate was going, do it. Do it. I went, I'm not good enough. You can play all that, mate. And so I went, not good enough to go on stage. All right, that. And it's one of the biggest regrets. Um, so that was like 2001-ish. Any part of that news? Um, I have no such thing anymore. I thought that was still good, and there you go. Which makes it even more pointless and senseless, all those deaths that took place, because they were just done for nothing. And they weren't even like, human. If, you can, if you can give somebody a humanely death. But to do what they did, the way they did it, was just outright fucking disgusting. I don't want to mention what it is on here because it's brutal. Oh, everybody knows what it is. It's just disgusting. What a way to go. Um, I can't really think of anything else. Um, YouTube. How did YouTube start? I've had my YouTube channel since 2007. Um. My first video, if you go all the way back, is of me sneaking up on my sister cutting the grass. Um, and at that particular time, the, the rip of my heart out and being trod on, that was at its peak at that point. Um, <clears throat> so I only opened it really to just put daft stuff on my own, just daft little jokey things, whatever. And I just did it for me. And if any of you mates wanted to watch it, and it, it stayed like that for donkey's years until sort of like two, three, two, three years ago, something like that. So, yeah, coming up to years ago, and um, I just happened to a video that I'd watched because I'd started watching unboxings and stuff of films and things like that. I don't know what it was, you know, when you, you start watching something. And then other, it leads to something else, to something else, to something else. And I seen somebody unboxing stuff. I thought, oh, this is like the kind of stuff. I would do. I didn't know people did, did videos on this. Um, <clears throat> and the people I started to watch at the time, pretty much the same now, um, was uh, John at Mondo Celebek. And I watched it. And I remember the first. <laughs> The first time I watched him, I thought, you miserable looking bastard. And I knew straight away by the said he was a Geordie. And like Laura come in the stage, she went, Who the fuck are you watching? I went, I said, I'll tell you what he knows his stuff. I said, But my God, what a miserable look at me. She went, I was gonna say, has he seen his ass? I went, Well, yeah, I said I, I don't think I can bear watching him anymore. But there was always something. <clears throat> Mainly keep going back. I just he was just absolutely had me mesmerized and that was and the more i watched him the more i started to like him and i can't remember what it was now but he, he did this video once uh and i commented and it was i think some that was said about video nasties and stuff and he replied um 
And then we just like started, it was weird. He sent me a message and I replied back. And we just started talking like that. And I, I just said as a joke, to be honest, um, oh, we, we should go and do a live one of the live streams that they do where we should do a video. And asked these one, and he was like, that's a good idea. I don't think anybody's doing them. I was like, I was actually joking. W would you do one? I went, I don't know. Um, he, said, he said, I'd probably give it a go, yes, yeah, but my God, I'd be nervous. And I was shitting myself. This was the first time I was ever going to be going live or doing anything film related. But as soon as he started, he started talking after the first few minutes. Talking. <clears throat> and I really enjoyed it. So we said we were going to do a series of them. And then it, from that first one, um, and because I was showing like some soundtracks and films of these video nasties and stuff, he was like, you've got some hellish stuff there. He said, you I can't. Well, why not? I went, because I'd, I'd be a dick. I wouldn't know what to do. He said, well, just do one and see you. I said, no, nah, I can't do it. And this went on for weeks. Oh, and like when, when Nige did his first video, I'm like, give it a rest, give it a rest. And he went on and on and on. And then I went, oh, for fuck's sake, all right, I'll do one. He went, well, look at it then, because I want to see it. And I went, don't know what I'm going to do it on yet. And I, sat and I thought, I thought, right, I'm going to start with the film to show my collection. See how that goes. So the first one I did was The Warriors. Um, and I showed what formats I've got of it and what soundtrack I've got and stuff like that. And uh, I think the, the, that's how I started off. I just started like picking one film, showing the format of the film I had and showing the soundtrack if I had it. So I did like The Warriors, I did The Shining, I did John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, I think I did Fright Night. I did quite a few of them. And then people start to say to me, hey, why don't you do an unboxing? I was like, what do you mean? Like when you get a film and they put open it and talk, I was like, all right, I'll give that a go then. So that's how they started. Um, and then somebody said to me, would you ever do a go on a Blu-ray hunt? That's it. Where they're going to HMV with the camera. And I, would, I don't think so. I couldn't talk in a shop like that. I'd feel stupid. Especially the KMB Army. <laughs> Out fat stuff. I'd feel so stupid. And I've never done one of them to this day. Um, and that was it. Just took off from there. John was giving me shout outs all the time and it kind of steadily grew. Then I was getting more and more watches and then be like a couple of months later, I think it was, he said to me, oh, there's a lad been asking about you. I went, really? He went, yeah. He said, uh, he's called Pete. I went, he said, the channel is called Play Tendo Guy. I went, has he got long and John was like, yeah, I went, I watch him. How weird. I was like, how do these famous people over the air to me? Because I thought if you had a YouTube channel, you were famous. People knew who you were. I didn't know. I was very naive about it. And, and Pete was one of the ones I was watching. He said, I think he wants you to go on his stream. And well, my ass went. <clears throat> I went, he said, I think you should do it. Like, I think it'd be good for you. I went, I'll probably do it then. Yeah, he went, he said. I'll let him know. He's probably going to get in touch. And he did. And that was how I met Pete. And we're going on Pete's stream um, for the first time. That's how I met Andy. At the time, Mike was on. But that week that I was on, Mike was on all day. So they asked me back again a couple of weeks later. And that's how I met Mike. And it just spread from there. I think Scott was a guest once. Um, and it was literally after he'd been on with us that time. Scott then said to me, Would you, do you fancy coming on my stream? And then it steadily started to grow. And then the numbers just like, I was like, my God, before I knew it, I was at 300 subscribers. And then it got to four and then five. And then I was like, wow. And it was getting quicker and quicker and quicker. Never, ever in a million years did I ever think I'd still be doing it nearly two years down the line. I thought I'll do about half a dozen videos, 10 videos. It'll show no interest. It'll die a death. And I shall just fuck off quietly and not say a word. Didn't expect this at all. It's been amazing.
and still is amazing. I love it. Um, so that's that much all I've got to say, really. Well, I mean, it's a very comprehensive answer. I would probably, if I was to ask you just to elaborate a little bit, I'd probably say something along, along the lines of this. <clears throat> Sounds very much like YouTube has been a very positive thing for you. Um, doesn't sound like yeah. there have been too many negatives, right? But if you could elaborate on a negative, um, what would it be? And I'd, the other thing I'd probably say it would to you was, would you also say, therefore, that um, a pro or a positive um, for YouTube is is to collaborate uh, and bring our hobbies together closer because that's my greatest feeling is that um, collaboration is there because I one of the things that happens with collaboration for me is you share sort of like a little bit of the burden and also you spark off an idea off of someone sometimes just the mere mention of a word can bring back a smell or a thought or whatever it is in me. And I can then go off in a total tangent. Um, and so I'm a big believer that um, I want to get out there and talk more, but you know, there are very few outlets for you to do it in. So I, I'm, I'm one of these big people that want to promote other channels because I want people to see these people. I want them to grow. I want them to do well. I want to hear more. I want more. I, I'm, I'm a greedy person. I'm a person that what if, if a piece of knowledge has been given to me, I want more knowledge. I don't want you to end there. So can you name a negative then, a, a, a downside of it? Um, and and I, I think we, we can sort of like end your block if you, if you, if you can't think of anything more. But I, I think the positives have all been mentioned. But... What's your thoughts, you know, on a negative of what YouTube? It could be about trolls. It could be how you felt, how other people have made you feel. It could be all sorts of stuff, stuff that you've been open to because your your numbers have grown and your face has become more well-known. Maybe you want to talk about that. Um, straight away, as soon as you said a negative, um, the two words are positive to my head where keyboard there's plenty of them um they will try and get you wound up they will um and if you are starting out don't let that bother you it's what i've back because i'm nine times out of ten off in my is 10 times out of 10 they are all faceless keyboard warriors they don't have they don't have any photos you don't know who they are if they do have a photo nine times out of 10 is it's a false account they will go and make these accounts you block them they'll go make another one just so their sad little wives feel better so they can come and insult you or call your names i've seen people reduced to tears and it's not nice and it's not fair um i will just give them a mouthful um i've actually stuck up for people getting bullied as well because i've been bullied at school it's not nice it doesn't matter if you're getting bullied and you don't know who it is people oh, well it's only on the internet it's not real it doesn't matter it is real and it does affect people really bad ways you got to think that teenagers and kids have actually ended their own lives through bullying online bullying and it's exactly the same if you're on a live stream. If you say it to the wrong person, they can really take that to heart. Um, they just need to grow up. If they don't like what they see, stop watching. That's all it takes. It's not rocket science. Um, and also, the good thing is, there is more good out there than there is bad. I have met some absolutely amazing people um and i met some exceptionally generous people um including your good self where i had stuff sent to me with absolutely nothing expected in return 
I didn't get into this to do like a an exchange of stuff like you know like oh well I tell you what I don't want this you've got that if you send me that I'll send you this or you can have this for you. I didn't start it for that. Begin with I've got nothing else to send you back. Doesn't matter. I don't want. I'm not doing it for that. I'm doing it because like I really like your channel. I like watching your videos. And that never really occurred to me. And it was like, I tell you what, it doesn't have make you feel good when somebody says that to you. Um, and it doesn't really particularly matter what somebody sends you. It could be it could be a DVD, it could be an old VHS tape, it could be a Blu-ray or a 4K, it could be a pile of stuff. It doesn't matter what it is. What always goes through my mind is that person that took something out of their collection that they once bought. Or they have gone and bought you something as a gift specifically for you out of their own money and their own time and sent it to you. It doesn't matter whether it was 99 pence or whether it was 20 quid. It doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is somebody has gone out and sent you that thing. And it's like every time it just makes you think, Jesus, these people who don't even know me are sending me this stuff. And my God, it just makes you feel fantastic it really really does i've had some amazing stuff sent um never asked for it people have sent me stuff one of the one of the ones that sticks to mind is there was a guy started watching some of my maiden stuff and he's from america um and he, he just commented and he said um love your maiden videos and that and he's like how, how can I send you something? I was like, I'm in England, you know. You're an American. I'm well aware of that. So I said, right, are you on Instagram? You can message me there. So he messaged me. He said, I've got something for you. I think you're going to enjoy my address. And then a couple of weeks, two, three weeks later, I never really thought. And then I got this parcel turn up. And I opened it. I said, I couldn't believe it. It, it. it was a phone call pop thing. But it was like one of the big box things. And it was an Iron Maiden album cover. Now, this thing wasn't cheap. And uh, I don't think I've heard from him since. But he just wanted to send me this thing. Strange. Really strange. In a good way. It's like, I think I want to have a little go of a channel. Do it. I hope you don't try. Um, and you can meet some fantastic people. You really can. If you do get any negatives or like that, you've just got to let it go. Let it go. They're not worth it. The first time you do feel all chewed, you think, shit, is this going to be a thing now? But the amount of people I've blocked, I went, oh, fuck off, and then forget about them. They're not worth it. Um, But, yeah, that's, that's the biggest negative, really. And also, as well, when I mentioned that you do meet some great people. You do. There's some fantastic people. And even though you've not met them in the flesh, you actually do become genuine friends with them. And another downside to that is recently we lost one in the community, and it is one of the saddest things. Awful. Suddenly. Just like that. 43-year-old. Um, he's no longer with us. And you, you do sort of you do th go through the grieving sort of process as well it's like you know these people they feel like you're mate remember the first time i ever met him on on a stream it was like i'd known him for years we were talking and he was like it was like we knew each other and he said i've got to get you over here we've got to go for a pint and unfortunately it never happened um so you do get stuff like that and um, but it does it goes to show you how sort of like up close and personal you can get with people you usually get a a feeling for when somebody's genuine and the people who you get on with. Um, but I'm not going to lie, that this place does have its fair share of weirdos as well. Um, but you can normally suss them out. Um, but yeah, I've got to admit, 95 to 99% of my time on here has been nothing but positive. Um, and the long way to continue, may I add. Fantastic. Um, is that the end? Because yeah. I'm just going to just say thank you very much for the nice, kind things that you said about me during that that, that statement. Um, Not a problem. That, 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 was your, that was that was your platform, and I and I won't 
piss or talk all over it um the one thing i will say that the only thing that youtube that upsets me i think the most is falseness and possibly the another word that crops to mind is lies i think i've had two of those things happen to me in yes. the last six to seven months but everything else even some of the things that have been low have been positives. I've learned something from it. I've moved on from it and I've become a better person because of it. That, but those two other things, there's been no positive from it. Mm -hmm. All it's done is caused disruption. And when you think back at it, you, you still bewildered on how it happened. So there's nothing really to mention about it. It's just, um, in our community, we know what we're talking about. Um, the one thing I want to add is um, we need watership down releasing people. Can we get some sort of petition together? Yeah. Because both of us are most mortified that we're still waiting for water down. I know it sounds sad, but I want to put at the end of this stream that we'd like to have watership down, please. Um, I'm going to give you an example. of It was supposed to get air release cancelled. Um, the teasers with these photographs of this beautiful 4K box set, poster, book, book, 4K Blu-ray, double-sided poster, one of the UK quad on, I'm like, I'm having this. For anybody who doesn't know, which is probably most of you, Watch It Down is my favourite animated film of all time. I'm not massive on animated films, I do like them, but that, wow, love it. And I pre-ordered it. And then the back and asked them, is it gonna be released? They just totally ignored me, they didn't reply. I've heard it's something to do with the director. He's supposed to have been a bit dodgy about the way it was distributed and stuff, and he kept money that he shouldn't have kept. But why was this not stopped when the DVD and Blu-ray releases come out? It's only now the 4K. And if they have pressed up any of those box sets, they are in existence somewhere. I don't know if it got if it got any further than the mock up. I don't know, but please BFI, get out your ass and get this sorted, please, because it was a beautiful edition that you were going to release. And I mentioned it because I wanted it, so that's why I brought it at the end. I knew that you're a big fan of it. I pre-ordered it, and it was you that told me it was cancelled. And I went, "You tell him, you're kidding." It was you that in one of the very first times that I ever met you or talked to you that told me, oh, no, that's cancelled. And I went, oh, you're jerking. I oh, can't God. believe you just told me that. Um, the one thing that I don't like about YouTube, like I said, I talked about falsehood. I'm going to give you an example of falsehood that I don't like. People that are in their 20s and 30s that do a broadcast that says, I've never heard this music before and I'm listening to it for the first time and you're going to see my reaction on it. Now, the worst example of this that I saw was a, was a couple that are in America. They're about 25 to 30, and the episode was called My Reaction to Elvis. So he starts off by turning around and saying, I've never heard any song by Elvis. I only know of him. Never heard anything, and you're going to see my reaction, and we're going to play... The wonder of you now. So he puts his headphones on. You hear the tune and at the end. He goes, "Oh wow, what a voice!" Uh, yeah, he's been on adverts. He's been everywhere. He's been at the soundtracks of films. He's been in television. And you're telling me at 29 and in this century, you've never heard of the song from Elvis ever. I'm supposed to believe this bullshit. So I just go, "You lying bastards." And you keep bringing them out. And there's ones there that say, the first time listening to the Beatles, the Beatles! Yeah, the first time listening to Frank Sinatra. That's my rant over. I'm sorry, but I have to mention it. It's a load of crap. But what, what about that Elvis and song that got remixed that... by the DJ, went to number one? That little less conversation? Yeah. A little bit more, yeah. No, this I don't believe for one second it. that they haven't heard of that. Never, never heard of it. Oh, my first time listening to Elton John. Elton John? You're telling me that, that that song that went out and sold the biggest number of records and all that sort of stuff, it was televised all around the world. You've never 
heard a, or a song by Elton John or heard him sing. Lying bastards. Bullshit. And that's what I think should not be on YouTube. But anyway, I told you we end with 10 questions. Now, I've always wanted to do this. This is something from a TV show that I watched, and I still watch it now, called Inside the Actors Studio with uh, a James Lipton. And he used to interview actors, and he would then ask them 10 questions, psychological questions they're supposed to be, that were generated by someone called Bernard Pivot, French bloke. Okay, and he's had he's had people like um, um, Martin Scorsese on. He's had um, you know all the all the wow. big directors, all the actors, actresses. He's asked the same ten questions, <laughs> and I'm going to ask them to you now, <laughs> now Nigel, because I want to know what your answer is. To them. Okay, so they are in an order. What is your favorite word? Cunt. Number two, your least favorite word. Franchise. What turns you on? Vaginas. What turns you off? Bums and willies. Male. Favorite curse word? Fuck. <laughs> Sound or noise that you love? Oh, ASMR when they're doing that. Tapping with the fingernails. Sound or noise that you hate? Um, the voice of local druggies slash chavs. And I want to swag down and all that shit. What profession, other than what you have done, would you have liked to have done? What profession would you have liked to have been in? Professional basis in a successfully famous band. And what profession would you like to do? Professional musician in a very famous band. It can be the same answer. It is actually sort of similar question, but slightly different. Last question, the tenth one. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get to the pearly gates? Hurry up and get through these gates. Your mum and dad are over there and they've been waiting for you. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Those are the 10 questions. Wonderful. I've been, totally enjoyed this. Very welcome. Um, it, it's been a long time generating all the questions and getting it into a format that I thought would work. And I'm so glad that I've had yourself as the very first one. Um, I'm hoping I do more of them. Um, I'm going to end it with you again. I want you to mention or promote anybody that you'd like to promote at the end of this, you know, um, go and sub them, go and like them. A reason on why, if you wish. Um, but I think that would be a nice thing from you um, and shows just what a generous person that you actually are, because I think now everybody knows what a generous person you are. I hope everybody never has a negative about you, um, even if you're, you're totally wrong about Blade, Blade Runner and Alien, but that's neither here nor there. So that's my little joke at the end. Um, over to you, and I will just do my bit at the end for ending. So over to you, Nigel, to promote anything uh, of your friends. Yeah, first of all, he knows us a little joke because in his heart he knows that uh, people who I would like to promote um, this man for having me on and for being so generous to me 
over the last coming up year or so. Um, but I'm assuming you've got to be subscribed if you if you're here. If not, get subscribed to him um, and watch some of his blogs. I watch them every week, um, and he just talk about some pretty interesting stuff. However, I do skip past the computer stuff because I'm lost. Subscribe to it's going to be people who probably everybody knows. Um, John over at Mondo Chelebeck Movies. If it hadn't been for John, I would be doing this. He's the he's the one who got on at me to do it and do it over and over. And he's the first person who I ever went on a string with. Um, Pete, a play Tendo guy, um, well worth the sub. He does unboxings and stuff. Uh, talks about films. He's a big gamer as well. But if I hadn't been for Pete, I wouldn't have been on all these live streams. It would have just been me and John doing the um, video nasty ones. Pete's got me out there um, and got me more known. Scott, Scott the movie critic. Um, again, I met Scott through Pete, so Pete's got a big input in that one, but I'm now on Scott's every single week. I'm a permanent co-host with him, um, and we just have an absolute blast week after week. Um, Andy at Forgotten World of Movies, such a lovely lad, absolutely just a genuinely nice lad. He's got a fantastic collection. Um, he's also a co-host. Um, my other co-host, Keith, Euphoria Pictures. Uh, he's got probably the most <laughs> jealousy-inducing collection you will ever wish to see. Um, he's got a fantastic Irish accent, um, which is probably why I get on with him so well. Um, and the four of us, we just bounce off each other all the way through the stream. All the people I'd like to say, because um, I'll explain as I say them. Sammy G. Uh, Sam Glendon over to Sammy G's World of Cinema. Wish to meet. Um, he'll open the atelier if you ask. Yes, he, he has. God, I told him. I did for him what John did for me. I just plagued him and plagued him. You need to do a channel. He is so passionate about his films. Um, channel, and he's doing great. He had over 100 subs, I think, within a week. I don't know anybody who's had them that fast. <laughs> he's a lovely lad. He really is. So, yeah, go and check out Sam as well. Um... Who else do I watch? Yeah, that might be about it. The ones who I think of, like, oh, the, they're, they're the ones um, who I'm the closest to. Um, and they're, they're all my mates, so I absolutely love to bits. I love them daily. Um, I can't imagine being on YouTube without them now. Not at all. I really can't. Um, and I'd love to give a shout out. Well, go and subscribe to his channel and check his videos. Out. Um, it's Savage Zombie Reviews. It's Dave. Um, very very funny fella. Loves again loves his films. He does reviews and stuff. So entertaining. Very 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 sadly missed. So yeah. Go check all those lads out because they're all absolute diamonds, every one of them. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And I just want to add that I put Nigel on the spot there, and I know I've put him on the spot. If he didn't mention a particular person or a channel, don't feel disheartened. It's very hard when you're under the spotlight or when you're talking or when somebody has just asked you to do something to remember everybody. Um, I'm sure... Um, like just like uh, myself, Night watches hundreds of channels. Um, you know, um, so there was just a short fraction there. I will add Ryan, uh, um, that we do watch Ryan on there. Um, and I and do apologize if I have anybody out exactly, actually, which is like you which said, is put well, on the spot. I just... Yeah, it's which is why I'm think. saying I put him on the spot, and that's why that you should not be disheartened about it. Um, I would How in all the fuck could I forget Ryan, really? 
<laughs> we've met, we've met, we've met so many diverse people, and we all love them to bits. And um, we yeah. still want them to be around, and and we love our chats with them. I'm going to ask you to say how you end all of your streams, Nigel, and I will do the way that I end my stream, and then I'm going to hit the end button. So over to you, my friend. You've got a famous way of ending your videos. Over to you. Thank you very much for watching, all two of you. I really do appreciate it. And until the next time I see you, you all take care of yourselves. Ta-ta. And I'm going to end, as I always do, with my salute. And say thank you very much for watching and look out for the next one. Bye-bye from the both of us.